Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to News 18 Network presents Green Ribbon Champions, powered by REC Limited. Knowledge partner, PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, special partner, National Jute Board, and associate partner, Sampurna Advertising. I'm your host for the evening, Ritika. This is an exclusive event that celebrates India's commitment 
to the environment and also salutes the change makers who've been working towards promoting a more environmentally responsible consumer behavior in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for being here today with us. It's a laudable initiative and each one of you present in this room has contributed to a greener tomorrow. So let's kick started with a huge round of applause for all the green champions here. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, this initiative aims to bring together policymakers and environmentalists and a lot of stakeholders related to the issue, but then also the Green Ribbons Champion aims at encouraging clean and green technology adopters, best sustainable practices, environment-friendly initiatives, and energy efficiency practices in line with the SDGs. To the Green Ribbon Champions Initiative, we are bringing together thought leaders, environmentalists, change makers. Honorable Minister, thank you so much for your time today. Despite a demanding schedule, it's really an honor to have you here with us. All the stakeholders at this platform, along with the PSUs, to deliberate on a wide range of topics relevant to the ever-evolving and transformational initiatives for a greener tomorrow and the much-needed shift to transform our future. Now, as put forward at COP26, India announced its Panch Amrit commitment, which includes reaching non-fossil energy capacity of 500 gigawatt by 2030 meeting 50% of its energy requirements from renewable energy by 2030, reducing the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons from now onwards till 2030, reducing the carbon intensity of its economy by less than 45% and achieving zero net carbon emissions by 2070. Now, as India's economy is already 10% more energy efficient than both the global and G20 average, India took less time to go from half to full electricity access over other major economies. Now, already the third largest national market globally for renewables, India has recently seen the growth of consumer-centric solutions like distributed solar PV takeoff with rooftop solar growing 30 fold in less than a decade. And so, through the evening, we will explore the role of India's public and private sector enterprises in fronting the commitments by the government of India and key initiatives and projects by the PSUs and private sector enterprises, which have truly championed the green cause for its people and for the planet. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, I once again welcome all of you to News 18 Network presents Green Ribbon Champions, powered by REC Limited. And now, to commence the evening and to set the context for it, I would like to invite CNN News 18 Managing Editor, Special Projects, Anna Narasimhan, for a welcome address. Namaste and Jai Hind, everybody. Thank you very, very much, uh, Union Minister Hardi Puriji, and to all the distinguished guests present here, environment enthusiasts from around the world. Welcome to the Green Ribbon Champions. This is the second edition, a celebration of Bharat's unwavering commitment to the environment. Bharat, under the visionary leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, embarked on a transformational journey with the launch of Lifestyles for Environment, or LIFE, this initiative at the COP26 in November 2021, inspiring environmentally responsible consumption and behavior on a global scale with an economy that boasts 10% greater energy efficiency than both the global and the G20 averages, we have set a compelling example. <clears throat> and we'll have Hardeep Puriji talking about it in just a bit. Now, as the world's third largest national market for renewables, Bharat is witnessing a surge in consumer-centric solutions such as remarkable 30-fold growth in rooftop solar installations in less than a decade. We stand as a beacon of leadership 
for emerging markets and developing economies in the global south, spearheading initiatives like the International Solar Alliance, One Sun, One World, One Grid, and the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, and of course now the latest, the World Biofuel Alliance. India's approach to achieving global net zero emissions is firmly rooted in the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, holding developed nations and international financial institutions accountable for facilitating the clean transition of the developing world. Bharat's bold Panchamrit commitments unveiled at COP26 reinforce its dedication to a sustainable future. These commitments include reaching a non-fossil energy capacity of 500 gigawatt by 2030, and we are more than halfway there already, meeting 50% of its em energy requirements through renewable sources by 2030, reducing projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons. 1 billion tons from now until 2030, lowering the carbon intensity of its economy by less than 45% and achieving net zero carbon emissions by 2070. We are getting more aggressive because the Prime Minister, we're given to understand, has actually advanced that by about 15, 20 years. The 2022 IPCC report applauds India's record of low emissions per capita compared to the other major world economies, solidifying its position as a climate leader, while the Climate Performance Index ranks India as the top performing G20 member in overall climate performance. Today, as we convene at the Green Ribbon Champions event by the News 18 Network, we celebrate the outstanding individuals and organizations that have propelled Bharat's environmental stewardship to new heights. The Green Ribbon Champions' honor is to clean green technology adopters and the best sustainable practices, environment-friendly initiatives, and energy efficiency practices that align with the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals. As we embark on this inspiring journey, let us collectively celebrate and acknowledge the trailblazers, visionaries and change makers who are steering Bharat towards a greener, more sustainable future. Together, we can forge a path that leads to a healthier planet and a brighter tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Anand, for setting the momentum for this evening. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to invite our guest of honor for the evening onto the dais. With a generous, generous round of applause, please welcome the Union Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas and Housing and Urban Affairs, Sri Hardeep Singh Puri, to deliver the opening address. Thank you very much. I'm going to place three propositions before you, and I believe they are self-evident truisms. You can agree, disagree, but I hope at least the discussion on those will give you some idea on how I see the evolving energy situation in the world. First and foremost, energy is the lifeline of any economy. So if you're talking about how a country is doing, and by performance here I mean economic performance, a sure indicator in the measurement of that performance would be the growth in energy consumption. The second proposition I want to place before you is that the time has come for us to be able to shift the hard facts from the waffle that is normally created. And my second proposition, which I want to place before you, is there is actually no energy shortage in the world today. By energy, I mean traditional fossil fuels. The world has, over a period of time, been consuming something like 102 billion million, sorry, 102 million barrels of crude a day. That 102 million barrels is actually available. But some countries who, and I want to be diplomatically correct, who are broadly categorized as the producers, they have decided for a variety of reasons on the quantity of energy, that is crude oil, that they will 
release into the market. So today, if I'm not mistaken, from 102 million barrels a day, the amount of crude oil being released is about 95, 95 million barrels or so. Now, if you talk to the producers, and I'm still on point two, if you talk to the producers, they will tell you that we don't determine prices. Fair enough. I don't think there's any formal mechanism which the producing countries use in order to be able to say, well, the price of crude should be $92 a barrel today or $110 a barrel tomorrow. But what they do de determine is the overall quantity of crude oil that they are going to release into the market. And my submission to you is that that quantity, either in increase or in decrease, determines the price. But that's not the only thing. Sometimes even when they want to increase the price or reduce the price, in comes the wild card or the uh, new elephant in the room, which is the consuming countries. You can produce all the oil you want to or refine all the oil you want. You, you can. And India is not uh, insignificant in that. I think our refining capacity today is about 252 million, uh, 252 million metric tons per annum. And we are taking that up to 300 million metric tons per annum. The Prime Minister even used 450 million metric tons per annum at the India Energy Week. I'm a little more cautious. I say we are targeting 400 million metric tons per annum over a period of time. The refineries which are in the pipeline, those are, we are already at around 300 plus we'll reach. So the first proposition was energy is the lifeline of an economy. If there is energy usage, economy is doing well. Number two, there's no shortage of crude oil in the world. And the third one is comes to what the subject of your deliberations this evening is. Anand is an old friend, so don't mind if I pull his leg a little. I think his introductory notes were written with my friend R.K. Singh in mind. I know he's coming next. But it was about solar, it's about rooftops, etc. Now, don't quote me to him. I know you've got me uh, on, on, on record. So I'm always saying nice things because we are not only colleagues in the cabinet, but we also go back. Uh, we were uh, civil servants together. Actually, the guys who raise the prices because they reduce the supply, they are motivated by a single consideration, which is which is that they have something which is going to go out of fashion. Because the environmental lobbies and others will all gang up and say, no more use of fossil fuel, no more petrol, no more diesel. So periodically, they will want to maximize the return on their sovereign resource. Excuse me. Excuse me. Can you please have your conversation outside? Yeah. So occasionally they will want to play that game. Now, I think you should all collectively write them a letter of thanks. Because the kind of things that I'm witnessing today, I'm not only talking about my friends to hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cell buses and he's promised to give me 15 by there but I think the shift to biofuels my god up to about 2014 it was almost impossible to dream of India reaching 5% biofuel mixing when I was an ambassador and I was accredited to a major biofuel company uh, country the dream of the government was to have 5% biofuel mixing in 10 of our states and union territories, and by Joe, we tried very hard, we couldn't succeed. There are a number of reasons. One is that your policies were not conducive to that 5% achievement. And on comes Mr. Modi. There's a complete sea change. He sets a target of 10% biofuel blending by 2022, November, and our OMCs and everybody else involved manages to succeed in five months less than that. Then we have a target of 20% blending 
by 2030 and we make a realistic assessment. We see what we are capable of and we say, no, we won't do it by 2030. We'll do it by 2025. And in April of this year, if I remember correctly, we introduced something called E20, which is a 20% blended fuel. And today it's available at how many stations? 5,000. In April, you start an E20 biofuel mix, and today over 5,000 stations have it. I don't want to repeat the young lady uh, who's uh, compared, who's the MC, she, and then Anand again. You read out the five nectar elements, Panchamrit, of the PM. We have a net zero target by 2070, but what I say, that's why I think you are more on solar energy, good, but uh, look at what these guys are doing. IOCL, net zero target here, 2046. Give them a big hand. They are not only India's largest, I hope you're India's largest, and the seventh largest in the world. ONGC, 2038. Gale, 2040. BPCL, 2040. HPCL, 2040. OIL, that is Oil India Limited, 2040. EIL is Engineers India Limited, 2035. So, I have deviated, as you see from my prepared script. You see three things happening. You see the global energy situation being managed in a particular way. Two years ago when oil prices hit the roof, the head of the India, uh, International Energy Association told me that that was the best year for energy transition. And I think if oil continues to be on the boil, I mean, the CMD of IOCL and all the other CMDs don't agree with me because they know a lot about energy and oil. I come to it with a fresh outsider's um, opinion and I have a very simple thing to say if in a if on top of a situation which is characterized by inflationary pressures on account of the stimulus packages you have high oil prices then you are not moving into and, and, and the rate cuts are taking and the, the rates are going up to absorb that ex excess liquidity so you will be in that big R situation so I said that to one of the big big King Kongs of oil. When was it, Rasal, in, uh, in, at Davos? And I said, you want to raise the prices, be my, uh, prices uh, through whatever supply management? You're going to be facing a very serious problem. And it happened. Three months later, I got a message saying, how did you know? Well, I think some of the most difficult answers in the world come from the most simplistic this thing. Today, our situation is most European economies are flat in terms of rate of growth. I'm not making this as a critical, I'm making this as an oil, uh, student of oil economics point of view. One major economy, which is the second largest in the world, which is, um, I think what, $20 trillion economy? They have no growth there. So Europe flat, large parts of the rest of the world not showing the buoyancy and growth. Where does India come in? And my submission to you is, India defies all these global trends. Today we are in a situation where if the rate of growth, the global average is 1%, we are growing at three times that percent. Number two, anyone who knows anything about the international oil market will tell you that in the next two decades, by next two decades, I'm saying, say, say 24, 25 to 45, 25% of the global growth will come from India. And what I'm telling you about India is, let me tell you the ethanol story. We started blending in 2014, increased the percentage. I'm given the figure that in nine years we saved 70, 73,000 crores by transitioning farmers from Annadatas to Urjadatas and boosting farmers' income from the payment of over rupees 76,000 crores in nine years. So in our case, clean energy is not just clean energy. It's also a major support to the agriculture sector. And what we are doing in sugar-based ethanol is only the start of the story. When Gadkari ji, who's the chief guest here, you ask him, I'm sure he will have very nice things to say. But we are going to 
corn, maize. We are going to second generation uh, ethanol, which comes from making it from parali or agricultural waste. And we are also now going into third generation technology. Second generation bamboo and more than. This 76,000 crores which we saved in last years also helped us in lowering carbon dioxide emissions by more than 402 lakh metric tons in nine years. So if the discussion is about environmental protection, if the discussion is about other things, I think there is a story pretty rampant here. And our oil marketing companies have paid the distillers more than rupees 1 lakh 26,000 crores during the last nine years to produce ethanol. In one of the neighboring states here, you should encourage them to move from portable alcohol to... Uh, but that I'll discuss with you separately. This may not be a relevant forum. And a mention was made of the Global Biofuels Alliance. I'm going to fast forward. When I started working on ethanol and I was ambassador to Brazil, a lot of my friends were very senior journalists and they thought that I have a personality uh, disorder that whenever I start working on something, I start discussing it. So whenever I came from Brazil to India, they said, here comes ethanol. It's been a long journey. The head of Unica, who is the Brazilian cooperative society from which makes ethanol, told me in 2006, he said, if India joins the ethanol train, ethanol can become, biofuels can become, an internationally traded commodity like crude oil. And lo and behold, there were a lot of cynics who said it couldn't be done. We now have an international biofuels alliance. And that biofuels alliance has three members who collectively account for 85% of global production. All right, India is the smallest of them and by far. But I think India is the one with the maximum potential. I asked somebody who prepares my research, I said, how much is the international biofuels market today worth? They gave me a figure of 92 billion. How much will it be worth next year? They said 192 billion. I can tell you with full confidence, and I'll give you two or three examples. Biofuels Alliance is slated to go not to 192 billion dollars, but in a few years time to 500 billion dollars. Let me give you some examples of that. We have an entrepreneur in Gujarat. You know, I am a firm believer that the Indian spirit of entrepreneurship. He imports 93 octane ethanol from Brazil. He imports it into Kenya. And Kenya doesn't have liquefied petroleum gas LPG cylinders. So he uses the ethanol for desktop cooking. There are a lot of countries in the world don't have either natural gas or liquefied petroleum gas which comes from the uh, crude oil refining etc. And they need a cooking medium. So if you're talking about the transitioning to green fuel, you need to get out of the wet wood, coal, kerosene kind of thing. And here's another usage. So I think this is a story which is just beginning to be fully understood. We have also what is called the Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Yojana Satat and Gobardhan Scheme. The concept of life introduced by the Prime Minister aims to promote sustainable level living by encouraging individuals to make changes in their lifestyles and emphasize responsible and conscious use of resources to safeguard and conserve the environment. We have a target of 5,000 Satat plants. We've started slow. But I can say with confidence that in the coming few months, we'll do quantum jumps. Because the idea of biofuels, including from sources other than sugar and maize, that is an idea which has, whose time has come and which is taking off. More than $1 trillion in investment to set up one TW of solar installations globally, making it clean and affordable by 2030, which is what we are talking about, eminently doable. Traditional energy sources, essential for making base load requirements 
while new and innovative energy sources are critical for combating climate change. I mean, if you do biofuels and you go to 20%, and why did we go to 20%? I mean, it's a good question. There's a very simple answer. When we started off, A, we did not have the confidence to feel that we would be able to achieve the 20%, but more than that, we were told, perhaps rightly, that if you have a 20% blending in automobiles, then the existing manufacturers of cars do not require major changes in the machinery of the car. But you know, you are now demonstrating going to 20% blending very soon and the car manufacturers are already way ahead. The engines which are coming in are E85, then you have this hybrid between battery operated and uh, uh, you know, uh, flexi fuel. So I think it's a very good story and now I come to the global green ribbon champions. It's people like you, the awardees, who have shown a commitment to the green transition. And I want to compliment uh, Anand and your channel because it's not what Network 18 is doing now. But I see an overall thing. If I had started talking about sustainable development goals when I joined the Council of Ministers in 2017, most people would have said, what is this? What is this game? Today, everywhere, I see my two uh, senior colleagues and friends from NBCC sitting here. Any big project now, I think you are now looking at the kind of technology that you use. The Honorable Prime Minister had a one-year-long competition called the Global Housing Technology Round in which he invited all the major construction companies in the world to come and demonstrate and showcase their technologies. Based on that, six lighthouse projects use, utilizing that technology are being implemented where 1,000 residential units are being constructed in one year. This is the change. And by the way, I need to now uh, conclude. Uh, but I want to conclude with two thoughts. When you succeed in any endeavor, then you can't say I've succeeded in here, but not so much here. Urban transport. I gave you the example of biofuels. I gave you the example of the hydrogen uh, fuel cell bus. I want to get, take you to some basic statistics. How many people do you think go to the petrol pump every day to fill up? Guess, rough guess. No, no, guess. Hmm? Pan India, how many people go to the petrol pump? Any two-wheeler, three-wheeler, bus, etc. Batao, Rasal, batao inko. Six crore people go to the petrol pump to fill up. And this is my other message to those who want to drive up prices. Recently, there was some national decision and they decided that uh, for one day they wouldn't fill petrol. So I'm saying that the, mark, the, the market card is also eminently playable, but more than that. 70% of the vehicular traffic on the roads is two-wheelers and three-wheelers, and many of them are going to go to batteries and so on, number one. So we are doing many transition. You are doing a transition to electric vehicles, whilst the electric vehicles, a number of charging stations are coming up, not only in Delhi, everywhere. You've already got this uh, green hydrogen silent revolution coming up. So we are in the happy situation that the six crore who go to the petrol pump every day, and this is my final concluding point, very soon the bulk of them will be moving from known traditional sources to one of the newer sources. I would be personally very happy if all the electric vehicles belong to a green grid, but it's going to take time. But I'm still better off with electric vehicles, even with a gray grid. And I'm not encouraging him because they said, I to to hydrogen bhi wo bichwali le no, nahi. Is pe compromise mat karna. Get the green hydrogen. So thank you very much. And I'm very grateful that you gave me a quiet hearing. Thank you. Can I come off or stay here? Thank you, Honorable Minister, for sharing such deep insights with us and many congratulations on government's initiators for a more sustainable and greener India. Um, 
As you see, the minister is here with us on stage because we are set for the first set of felicitations. Thank you, Anand, for joining him. Ladies and gentlemen, as we get down to felicitating our first set of Green Ribbon Champions, one second. please. Before you start the awards, uh, with your kind permission, can I put the Green Ribbon yeah, sure, badge sure. on your collar, sir? Sure. And a big round of applause for him, to him for championing the Bi World Biofuel Alliance. He's done a lot of work. It was announced at the G20. Big success. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And now we move into the first set of felicitations. Ladies and gentlemen, keep this applause going and keep it generous. And along with us, celebrate the first set of Green Ribbon Champions. So we're starting with the category called Green Initiative of the Year Towards Environment Conversation. And the Felicitation goes to Indian Oil Corporation Limited. We have Sri Shrikant Madhav Vedya, Chairman, Indian Oil Corporation Limited here with us to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations to Indian Oil Corporation Limited for winning the Green Initiative of the Year towards Environment Conversation. Moving on to the next category, the next felicitation, ladies and gentlemen, is for excellence in green technology adoption. And the felicitation goes to NBCC India Limited. We have Sri Pavan Kumar Gupta, Chairman and Managing Director, NBCC India Limited, to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations, NBCC India Limited. Moving on to the next category, the felicitation is for Green Energy Champion. And this one goes out to Indian Railways. Can we have Sri Shailendra Singh, Executive Director, Mechanical Engineer and HM in Projects Indian Railways, join us on stage to receive it. Many congratulations to Indian Railways. Next up, we're moving into the category Outstanding Environmental Commitment. And this felicitation goes to the Government of Meghalaya. We have Dr. Mazel Amparin Lingo here with us, Honorable Minister of Information and Public Relations, Government of Meghalaya, to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations to you. Please keep the applause going for the next category, which is Green Eco-Friendly Initiative. And this felicitation goes out to Vedanta Sterlite Copper. We have Srimati A. Sumati, Chief Operating Officer of Vedanta Sterlite Copper here to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations, Vedanta Sterlite Copper. The next category, ladies and gentlemen, is Excellence in Green Energy Financing. And this one goes out to please put your hands together for REC Limited. Can we have Sri TSC Bosch, Executive Director, Business Development and Marketing, Infra and Logistics Funding, REC Limited, to receive the award? And the last felicitation in this set is for Green Manufacturer of the Year. This one goes out to Design Boxed Agency. Many congratulations to you. We have Srimati Gunjit Kaur, Director and Co-Founder, Sri Aman Seth, COO, and Srimati Akanksha Kumar, Executive Manager of the Agency, to receive the felicitation. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Thank you so much once again for making time out of his schedule and being with us here for this set of felicitations. Can we see him off with a huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen?
We request all our guests at the back to kindly settle down. I request the guests at the back to kindly take their seats as we move on to the next. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, this is a laudable initiative and you know that this is the second edition of Green Ribbon Champions. And with every edition, we hope to encourage and inspire more and more enterprises to take up the cause of greener, more sustainable India. Thank you so much for contributing to a greener, more sustainable India and being a part of this initiative. We'll get forward into the flow of things in just a few seconds. Namaskar. Mantri Mandal mein mere sayogi Hardeep ji, Jitendra Singh ji, aur upasthit sabhi bhai aur beno. हमारे सोसाइटी और देश के तीन इंपॉर्टेंट पिलर हैं इथिक्स इकोनॉमी इकोलॉजी एंड एनवायरनमेंट इथिक्स के ऊपर तो एजुकेशन और बाकी जगह इतिहास संस्कृति विरासत को लेकर हम काफी काम करते हैं और इकोनॉमी तो मोदी जी के नेतृत्व में वर्ल्ड में हम तीसरी वर्ल्ड की सबसे बड़ी इकोनॉमी बनने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं वी आर द फास्टेस्ट ग्रोइंग इकोनॉमी इन द वर्ल्ड और चौथी बात है इकोलॉजी एंड एनवायरमेंट प्रधानमंत्री जी ने भी दो के पहले हमने उन्होंने ये उद्दिष्ट हमारे सामने रखा है कि हमारे देश को हम कार्बन न्यूट्रल बनाएंगे और इसलिए स्वाभाविक रूप से इंपोर्ट सब्सिट्यूट कॉस्ट इफेक्टिव पोल्यूशन फ्री और इंडिजीनियस इसके ऊपर हम लगातार काम कर रहे हैं हम 2 अक्टूबर गांधी जी का स्मरण कर रहे हैं गांधी जी ने स्वदेशी और स्वावलंबन की बात की थी और स्वदेशी और स्वावलंबन के विचारों से ही हमारे देश को हम कैसे आत्मनिर्भर पर बना सकते हैं ये हमारे सबसे पहला इम्पॉर्टेंट एजेंडा है बहनों और भाइयों गांधी जी कहते थे कि हमारा देश गांवों में बसता है आज एक समय गांव में 85 परसेंट पॉपुलेशन थी आज वो 65 परसेंट पर आई है ये 30 परसेंट पॉपुलेशन गांव को छोड़कर ये शहर की तरफ आई है ये खुशी से नहीं आई है गाँव में जाने के लिए रोड नहीं पीने के लिए पानी नहीं मिलता गाँव में स्कूल नहीं अच्छी अस्पताल नहीं है गांव में रोजगार नहीं है किसानों के फसल को सही दाम नहीं है हमारा एग्रीकल्चर रूरल ट्राइबल और विशेष रूप से जंगल ये एरिया जहां 65 परसेंट हमारी आबादी रहती है और जिनका जीडीपी ग्रोथ में केवल 12 परसेंट कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन है बाईस से 24 परसेंट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग सेक्टर से है बावन से चौपन सर्विस सेक्टर से है और इसलिए जब तक ये बारह परसेंट कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन जी ग्रोथ में एग्रीकल्चर रूरल ट्राइबल और फॉरेस्ट सेक्टर का है ये जब तक 24 परसेंट नहीं होता तब तक भारत आत्मनिर्भर भारत नहीं बनता और इसीलिए जल जमीन जंगल और जानवर पर आधारित नई टेक्नोलॉजी का उपयोग करके हमें देश को एक नई ग्रीन रिवोल्यूशन की तरफ जाना है हमारे देश में फॉसिल फ्यूल 16 लाख करोड़ का इम्पोर्ट होता है और इसी प्रकार से ऑटोबेल इंडस्ट्री लगातार बढ़ रही है तो आने वाले दो तीन साल में ये पच्चीस लाख करोड़ तक जाएगा और इससे 40 परसेंट पॉल्यूशन ये रोड सेक्टर पे होता है ट्रांसपोर्ट सेक्टर इसके लिए जिम्मेदार है मैं उसका मंत्री हूँ और इसलिए हमने ये तय किया है कि ये पोल्यूशन कम करना है एयर पोल्यूशन वाटर पोल्यूशन और साउंड पोल्यूशन से देश को मुक्ति देना ये हमारे लिए बहुत आवश्यक है और इसलिए दो इम्पॉर्टेंट फिलोसफी है जिसके ऊपर हम काम करते हैं एक है टेक्नोलॉजी नॉलेज इनोवेशन एंटरप्रीनरशिप साइंस टेक्नोलॉजी रिसर्च स्किल्ड एंड सक्सेसफुल प्रैक्टिसेस वी नेम इट एज नॉलेज एंड कन्वर्शन ऑफ नॉलेज इन टू वेल्थ इज द फ्यूचर दूसरी बात है नो मटेरियल इज वेस्ट एंड नो पर्सन इज वेस्ट इट इज इट इज डिपेंडिंग अपॉन द अप्रोप्रिएट विजन ऑफ द लीडरशिप एंड अप्रोप्रिएट टेक्नोलॉजी दैट वी कैन कन्वर्ट वेस्ट इन टू वेल्थ ये दोनों विचारों के आधार पर भविष्य के भारत का निर्माण करने का प्रधानमंत्री जी के नेतृत्व में हम सबकी मंशा है और इसीलिए आज हम लोग हमारे राष्ट्रीय महामार्गों में जो कचरा है सॉलिड वेस्ट उसको सेग्रीगेट करके वो अहमदाबाद डोलेरो रोड पर 25 लाख टन दिल्ली मुंबई हाँ, एक्सप्रेस हाईवे के पैकेज में और यूआर टू में 30 लाख टन हमने यूज किया और अब हम नीति अपना रहे कि कचरे को यूज करने के लिए देश की पूरी म्यूनिसिपल कॉरपोरेशन महापालिका और नगर के साथ हम सहयोग करेंगे और पूरा कचरा रोड में डालेंगे इतना ही नहीं तो जो गंदा पानी है शहर का जो रिसाइकलिंग होता है वो रोड कंस्ट्रक्शन में प्रायोरिटी से उपयोग में लाएंगे 
हमने बांबू का क्रैश बैरियर बनाया हमने फ्लैश लाखों करोड़ों टन ऑफ रोड में यूज़ की जो इन्वायरमेंट पॉइंट से बहुत ही अड़चन की थी इतना ही नहीं तो हमने एक हज़ार से ज़्यादा अमृत सरोवर बनाए और नदी नालों को खोद कर अमृत सरोवर की मिट्टी को खोद कर हमने फ्री ऑफ चार्ज ये काम किया है दौड़ने वाले पानी को चलने के लिए लगाओ चलने वाले पानी को रुकने के लिए लगाओ और रुके हुए पानी को ज़मीन को पीने के लिए लगाओ गाँव का पानी गाँव में घर का पानी घर में खेत का पानी खेत में वाटर कॉन्जर्वेशन से इरीगेशन बढ़ा सिंचाई बढ़ी जो हमारा कुएं का पंप एक घंटा चलता था अब वो बारह घंटे चौदह घंटे चौबीस घंटे चल रहा है तो एक प्रकार से वाटर कॉन्जर्वेशन हो इसके साथ साथ हमने पेट्रोल और डीजल में पेट्रोल में इथेनॉल मिश्रित करने का निर्णय यशस्वी रूप से अपनाया जिससे हमारा इम्पोर्ट कम हो रहा है प्रदूषण कम हो रहा है हमने डीजल में पंद्रह मिथेनॉल डालने का पायलट प्रोजेक्ट कर्नाटक से ट्रांसपोर्ट के साथ सक्सेसफुली इम्प्लीमेंट किया अब अशोक लेलैंड और टाटा ने हमारे इसमें मुझे खुशी है कि उन्होंने मिथेनॉल के ट्रक लॉन्च किए हमारे मेरे पास हाइड्रोजन की कार है अब हाइड्रोजन की बस और ट्रक बन रही है टाटा लेलैंड ने और हमारे आईसी इंजन में हाइड्रोजन डालकर गाड़ी चलाने का प्रयोग यशस्वी किया है अब हम इलेक्ट्रिक की कार इलेक्ट्रिक की बस इलेक्ट्रिक स्कूटर पॉपुलर हो गई उसमें तीन राइज है इतना ही नहीं तो जयपुर से दिल्ली हम इलेक्ट्रिक हाईवे केबल का बना रहे और इस पर बसेस चलेगी एयर कंडीशन बसेस होगी बिजनेस क्लास की सीटें होगी और हवाई जहाज जैसी सुविधाएं मिलेगी और टिकट रेट 30 परसेंट कम होगा हम लोग 260 सौ साठ रोप वे केबल कार फैनाकुलर रेलवे बना रहे हैं जिसके कारण डीजल की खपत कम होगी इतना ही नहीं तो हमने बांबू का क्रैश बैरियर बनाया हमने तीन करोड़ अस्सी लाख तीन मीटर के पेड़ लगाए अड़सठ हजार पेड़ हमने ट्रांसप्लांट किए अभी मैंने खुद मैं वहाँ गया था औरंगाबाद में पैठन में सौ साल पुराने इक्यावन वर्ड के टीड हमने ट्रांसप्लांट किए तो एक प्रकार से ग्रीन इनिशिएटिव काफ़ी लिए है अब विशेष रूप से बिटुमिन में हम लोग 15 परसेंट रबर पाउडर जो टायर वेस्ट टायर से निकलती है 7 परसेंट प्लास्टिक डालने की बात कर रहे हैं और इससे हमारे देश में 80 लाख टन बिटुमिन इंपोर्ट होता है उसमें से 50 लाख टन क्षमता भारतीय रिफाइनरीज की है तीस लाख टन इम्पोर्ट होता है अगर इस अस्सी लाख टन में अगर हमने पंद्रह रबर पाउडर डाली तो बारह लाख टन इम्पोर्ट कम होगा और रबर इस बिटुमिन से रोड की क्वालिटी सुधरेगी सात परसेंट हम प्लास्टिक डाल सकते हैं तो आने वाले समय में हमने स्टील फाइबर अब इन्फोर्समेंट कॉन्क्रीट में यूज कर रहे हैं जिसके कारण दो पियर के बीच में का डिस्टेंस पचास मीटर मैक्सिमम था वो एक सौ बीस मीटर तक होता है तो ऐसे अनेक प्रकार के इनिशियो प्री कास्ट को हमने पच्चीस टक्के मैंडेटरी किया है अभी हम हंड्रेड करने के पीछे लगे मुझे विश्वास है कि हमारे देश को प्रदूषण से मुक्ति देना अब जो परली जलती थी उसके कारण दिल्ली में बड़ी समस्या होती थी अब परली से बायो सी एन जी बायो एल बन रहा है 36 प्लांट चालू हो गए एक प्लांट प्रोसेस में है और इस देश में अब कोई परली जलाएगा नहीं उत्साह उससे सी एन जी एल बनेगा और इंपोर्ट कम होगा और प्रदूषण कम होगा मुझे खुशी है कि इंडियन ऑयल ने पानीपत में प्लांट डाला है परली से एक लाख लीटर इथेनॉल डेढ़ टन बायो विटामिन और उसके साथ साथ सबसे खुशी की बात है कि बायो एविएशन फ्यूल हवाई जहाज चलने वाला बनेगा इस देश का किसान अन्नदाता था ऊर्जादाता बन गया अब विटामिन दाता बन गया अब इसके बाद वो एविएशन फ्यूल हवाई ईंधन दाता बनेगा और आज मक्का गेहूँ चावल और शक्कर गन्न गन्ना इसको लगाने से किसान के प्रॉब्लम सॉल्व नहीं हो रहे हमारे पास हमारी एम ज़्यादा है और मार्केट प्राइस कम है सरप्लस प्रोडक्शन है और ऐसे समय डाइवर्सिफिकेशन ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर टूवर्स एनर्जी एंड पावर सेक्टर ग्रीन हाइड्रोजन की निर्मित ग्रामीण क्षेत्र में हो जल जमीन जंगल और जानवर पर आधारित नई टेक्नोलॉजी का उपयोग करके हमें आत्मनिर्भर भारत बनाना है जो हमारा गांव गरीब मजदूर किसान है जो ग्रामीण कृषि और जंगल और ट्राइबल सेक्टर में बसा हुआ है उनको आर्थिक दृष्टि से समृद्ध और संपन्न बनाना है टेक्नोलॉजी वहाँ ले जानी है रोजगार के अवसर निर्माण करने हैं हमने टूरिज्म में सब टूरिज्म में बहुत बहुत अच्छे से जगह को अच्छे रोड से जोड़ा है टूरिज्म ऐसा क्षेत्र है जिसमें 49 परसेंट एम्प्लॉयमेंट पोटेंशियल के लिए कैपिटल कॉस्ट खर्चा होती है आने वाले समय में ये देश की इकोनॉमी भी बड़ी हो बढ़े प्रोग्रेस हो हम वर्ल्ड की तीसरे नंबर की इकोनॉमी बनने का प्रधानमंत्री का सपना पूरा हो और दूसरी ओर इकोलॉजी एंड इन्वायरमेंट को भी हम प्रोटेक्ट करें हम एक स्वाधीन स्वतंत्र भारत के नागरिक हैं हम पर्यावरण की रक्षा करें आर्थिक विकास करें दोनों में संबंध में प्रस्तापित करें और विन विन सिचुएशन में फाइव ट्रिलियन डॉलर की इकोनॉमी और आत्मनिर्भर भारत बनने का सपना पूरा करें मुझे विश्वास है जिस तेजी से हम सब लोग कोशिश कर रहे हैं निश्चित रूप से हम होंगे कामयाब 
यही मैं विश्वास के साथ कहता हूँ मैं आज नागपुर जा रहा हूँ मैं कार्यक्रम में उपस्थित नहीं रह सका इसलिए फिर क्षमा प्रार्थी हूँ फिर से एक बार आपके कार्यक्रम के लिए मेरी बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं नमस्कार धन्यवाद We are extremely grateful to Shri Nitin Gadkari ji, the Union Minister of Road Transport and Highways. He could not be here um, physically, but he was kind enough to make time out and send this very special message for Green Ribbon Champions. Can we have a huge round of applause for the minister and the work in this field that his ministry is doing? And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to dive into the very first panel of this evening, which is on the theme "Sustainable Urban Living for the Future." Eco-friendly building practices are reshaping urban living and revolutionizing the way we design and construct our cities, promoting healthier, more efficient urban environments with improved air quality and reduced waste. And as urbanization continues to accelerate, eco-friendly building practices will need to be brought to more mainstream. And conversations like these we are having today will have to be pivotal. in helping to make that important transition to take this discussion forward ladies and gentlemen with a round of applause please join me in welcoming onto the stage cnn news 18's toya sink a very warm welcome to you toya So Toya is here with us to moderate the first panel of this evening and I will quickly get into inviting our esteemed panelists for the first session starting with Swapan Mehra founder Ayora Ecological Solutions Thank you for joining us Swapan We're very glad to have amongst us Vaibhav Dhange independent advisor And please join me in welcoming onto this panel Hari Natarajan program specialist action for climate and environment. Thank you gentlemen for joining us. Over to you Toya. Thank you so much. Um gentlemen we don't have much time for the large task we have carved out for us today. uh we're going to embark on a discussion as you've just heard uh, a discussion on trying to understand what the future of design sustainable design looks like for urban living that's the task but we don't have much time and so i'm going to dive straight into it hari i'm coming first to you i want us to tell our audiences so today in the audience we have uh, a number of industry leaders but watching from home we have audience members who may or may not be so familiar with where the current status of our country is so if you could first start us with a check tell us if we could almost get an eagle eye view of both the cities the villages tier 1 tier 2 across the country how does india rank where does india stand if you take a look at the current sustainable development across the country uh thank you toya uh we heard you know from the ministers about the significant progress that we are making on several fronts and so it pains me a little bit to kind of bring about a reality check uh in the last count on the sdg index or so the sustainable development goals index uh india stood fairly far, far behind we were about ranked at about 121 out of 163 countries we making decent progress on some of the indicators but when you look at the theme for the session today which is around sustainable cities uh, which is sdg goal 11 we are actually not making much progress if anything it's probably getting worse uh, if you look at cities globally urbanization accounts for about 50% uh in india currently our urbanization level stand at about 37% and slated to go up to 45% to 50% uh, over the next 15 to 20 years uh but when you look at it in terms of carbon emissions and resource consumption 
the urban areas actually consume an enormous amount of that. So when you're talking about the divide between rural and urban, about 60 to 70 percent of our resource consumption and emissions are actually coming from urban centers, uh, whereas rural India still has a fair bit to go in terms of development, right? So when you talk about sustainable cities and when you talk about SDG 11, we're talking about four key parameters. One is inclusive, the second is safe, resilient, and sustainable communities. These are the four parameters that you look at. And this kind of breaks down to about seven or eight different indicators. You look at affordable housing, improved public transport system, uh, reduced impact of natural disasters, both on infrastructure and life, reduced air pollution, access to water, uh, and uh, you know, uh, universal access to public green spaces. Now, in all of this, I think we have a fair distance to go. Uh, right now, we have a number of initiatives that the government of India has taken up, starting from uh, uh, you know, Smart Cities Mission, to the NULM, to uh, uh, Amrut Mission. So there are several aspects that we are actually addressing today. Uh, but again, the biggest thing that I personally believe we are missing is that integrated and holistic approach to development. Uh, a large part of what we are focusing on under the Smart Cities mission today seems to be focused exclusively on transport and then to the next level at solid waste management, water access, and so on and so forth. So can we actually start looking at infrastructure in a more holistic manner, which addresses the inclusive needs of society? And we also then, you know, uh, look at, uh, again, slightly confusing, but I think the other aspect of the development that we need to look at when we look at cities is to somewhere disconnect or break the connection between carbonization, so development versus carbon consumption, so making it more sustainable, moving or decoupling, you know, development from uh, carbon uh, consumption or emissions. So I'll probably stop there and give an opportunity for the others to come in and then there are a few more points that I can bring in. Okay, so we'll come back to you, Hari. Uh, Swapan, I want to come to you next. Um, one of the things that Hari was mentioning right now was the fact that perhaps the most important thing right now is the need for a more integrated framework when we're talking about development in cities. I'd like to ask you, because you run IORA, it's an organization that's worked with different communities across the country. Are there examples you've seen across the country of integrated setups. So we can talk first about cities. I'd then like to ask you, because this is something that growing up we've heard our elders say that, you know, in India, you've got a long tradition of sustainable practices, especially if you look at rural communities, tribal communities, etc. Is that something you found in your research? Other examples, even while looking at urban cities that we can look at? Absolutely. Firstly, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great opportunity. Um, I'd like to, before I, I, I jump to a response to that point, I'd like to um, sort of uh, uh, magnify one of the important statistics that Hari said, that we are at the moment 32 to 35% urbanized, and we are going to take this to 40%, which roughly means that we have a 2% rate of urbanization every year. That translates to about 25 million people moving from cities to urban centers every year. Uh, you know, the UN uh, classifies that as the single largest migrations of human in history is the Indian rural to urban migration. It's more than any other migration that we've ever encountered. What that means is that, uh, and, and like he mentioned, the footprint of urban Indians is about four times or three times that of rural Indians. So it's probably not an exaggeration to say that India, on its environmental footprint, will go where its cities go. Because all our demand is here, the footprint is here, the footprint cascades to the entire country, if not the entire world. So very critical that as we develop our cities, and that's a very important opportunity because we are probably better placed than most other countries in the world because we are developing new cities, several thousand every year. We can integrate into these best practices from a traditional wisdom from around the world to have cities with breathe, which are sustainable, etc. 
Um, so we have a long custom of sustainable and harmonious living with nature. I mean, that's something which has been part of our culture more than most of the countries in the world. And there are several examples of this. One of the key challenges with new cities is change in land use, right? Like if you look at modern cities, uh, the WHO says that in every city there should be at least nine meters square of green cover per citizen. Uh, Delhi, interestingly, is above that. It's about 10.5. But most other Indian cities uh, which are coming up are less than two. So because you don't have any green cover, because of your hard infrastructure, the reflectance of your heat is very high. Um, and as a result, there is this phenomena of the urban heat island effect. Uh, most Indian cities on an average have 1.5 degrees higher day temperature than rural areas. So this is a challenge. Air pollution exacerbates this. If you go back and look at how we used to live in the past, and there are examples of this. There are even now remote cities in smaller states, um, or smaller cities, sorry, in, in states which still are planned in such a fashion. Cities in Kerala, there are cities in Meghalaya as an example, there are cities in Assam which still imbibe this idea of land use where you allocate land use even at a household level at a fixed ratio between construction, between water bodies, between green cover. Hmm. So one is we need to imbibe this philosophy of sustainable land use management very well into what we do. Uh, the second is looking at a past in general about appreciating the value of nature. You know, one of the important things that's happening right now, which is driving a lot of our planning, is the appropriate immediate economic value of land as measured in the immediate return perspective, right? Like, how much can you monetize this for? Uh, if you were to put a cost to the ecosystem services that a patch of trees gives you in a city in terms of clean air, water purification, etc., the return is much higher than real estate. But we are unable to monetize it because you don't measure it. It's important to put a value there so that we can integrate that into our planning. Okay, just stay with us here. I want to now take your point to Weber. Weber, you are someone who's worked... and. I want to tell our audiences this, you've worked extensively with the building of highways across the country. I want to ask you, how do we build more in a manner that is climate resilient? I ask you that particularly because our audiences might remember the flooding that we saw in the last year in some hill states. So I'm talking right now, for example, about Himachal Pradesh. A number of experts looked at that situation. They said the highways, the kind of development that's taken place there, either that needs to be taking place at a slower rate or in a different manner. What are your perspectives on this? Thank you. Thank you, Toya. Uh, absolutely, as you said, uh, and both my co-panelists said, the, I think... We don't have option now to, to expedite and accelerate our, our whole uh, efforts in ensuring that, that our infrastructure, our urban infrastructure is, uh, you know, sustainably uh, resilient, safe. Uh, but I, I, I'll carry forward from where Hari started. I think we are still much, much away on integrated planning of our, our whether it is urban uh, landscape or whether it is infrastructure. I'll, I'll give you a few examples. For example, uh, Sweden, Stockholm, collects all of his uh, solid waste and converts it into a gas. And that entire gas is used to operate the public transport buses in Stockholm. So now, now ultimately, nature is the best uh, uh, tutor. Nature has shown us the most sustainable is recycle, reduce and reuse. If you can create that eco chain then it's more sustainable so i think our urban planning is still lack on that as hari and my co-panelists said our smart cities and other focus has been on the transport there's absolutely no doubt and most of them are those are if i may say we're on a low hanging fruits if uh, my panelists we may agree but uh, but the fact still remains that our urban planning whether it is real estate commercial industrial planning still not it does not take into account the urban transport issues while planning our townships, our industrial townships. For example, every day, uh, one lakh people travel from Delhi to Gurugam and come, come back from Gurugam to Delhi. So whatever amount of road or infrastructure you build, you are bound to have those challenges day in and day out. So what could be the most sustainable way? Or for example, tomorrow we decide to convert say 50% of in Delhi's or any of the top big cities in Delhi uh, or India to the electric vehicles, we still will have a challenge of, uh, you know, urban uh, transport, traffic jams, air pollution, you know, all those aspects linked to it. 
So my uh, uh, emphasize what I'm trying to make is uh, the biggest contributor of air pollution right now or, or the biggest challenge is the making our transport not only sustainable in terms of its fuel, cleanliness, emissions, but also to make it more efficient by making it more public. Mm -hmm. you, you can't have all people driving their own car and still we, we calling ourselves more sustainable. Right. So, so that, in a way, point I want to emphasize. On the second part which you said, uh, the, this debate will always go on. Mm -hmm. And that there is a challenge. And we will have to find a fine balance. For example, we recently saw in Uttarakhand or hill states, and there has been devastations uh, and, and infrastructure, I'm sure, has contributed something positively, but it has also contributed on the creating ecology, ecological imbalances. But I think that fine balance, our designers, our, our consultants, our research uh, teams, institution, not only in uh, exploring the more uh, sustainable way of designing, utilizing the ecological material, making it more recycled, making it more sustainable. The, our construction processes, our practices, everything will have to be looked at from that perspective. Okay. At the same time, we'll also have to look at how do we ensure that people living in those uh, areas are not uh, denied the opportunity of growth just because we, are, we don't want to create infrastructure for their growth. So it's a fine balance which we'll have to come out. For example, uh, uh, experiment is being tried in, um, in Himachal where instead of creating, you know, wider roads, there are two different routes, existing routes are being developed, one for going up and one for coming down. Mm. So I think our urban, I'm sure our urban planners and our infrastructure planners will, come, will be able to come up with those kind of solutions which will be more ecological friendly or eco-friendly as may say to ensure that our ecology is not disbalanced or, or not... Um, uh, uh, we still continue to uh, ensure that infrastructure growth is done and reach out to the every nook and corner of this country, but at the same time, create a lot of mechanisms where, uh, whether it is utilizing of the material, making it more greener, more, making it more cleaner, right from the machinery that is used, right from the material that is used, right from the processes that we follow. So I think all those put together will have to create that balance. The challenge okay. is there, but I think every challenge has an opportunity. Okay, so I want to come back to you. I'm going to ask you a final question that I'm actually going to take to all three of you. Uh, this is a deliberately framed, slightly gimmicky question. What do I mean when I say that? I want to ask you that if in the next 20 years, because the population boom that we're talking about, it starts, it's already taken place. By 2040, it would have significantly taken place to a much higher level. I want to ask you, Hari, I'm going to start with you. And this is where it gets gimmicky. If you had a magic wand and if there was one thing you could make policymakers, those who are constructing around the country, the UNDP, the organization that you run, if you could even make it also prioritize one single thing in development across the country over the next 20 years, what would it be? I'm going to come to each of you with this question. So this is always a challenge when there are so many issues to be addressed to then prioritize one uh, particular issue. But I just wanted to quickly reflect on something that Webhav said. And, you know, a lot of our planning is still looking at a linear kind of trajectory yeah. without necessarily looking at reimagining the whole issue of a sustainable community. So, for instance, uh, there is an example from Colombia, uh, Bogota. What the mayor did was he said the development has to be primarily people-centric. So you build spaces where people can move around freely and you have a transport ecosystem which doesn't interfere with those spaces. And it kind of runs around on the periphery. And you have these self-sufficient communities where you have housing, economic activity, etc., built into the same area so that the need for moving from one place to another itself is reduced. Now, this then comes to the next level. In terms of mobility, we still look at individual mobility. We are very, you know, in our development, we are very focused on the American model of, you know, having your own private vehicle. And if you look at some of the more uh, uh, urban metros here in India, each household probably has three, four, five vehicles, right? From there to say, if you want to move down the electric vehicle pathway where charging takes time, etc., can you actually look at more public transport 
and having centralized charging stations for those public transport and move people to, uh, towards that. Now, this is where I think the reimagining of uh, communities happens at two levels. One is the whole planning aspect around the infrastructure, which you need to kind of look at it completely differently. And the second part of it is behavioral change or the demand side. Mm. How do you nudge people to make those choices which are more sustainable? And again, as a very good example, in some of the European countries, a lot of offices actually, if you use metro service, your metro card is paid for by the company. So that's a good incentive for you to then use the metro system. Or in other way, if you look at electrical consumption, and if you want to move people to more efficient consumption, the bill actually has an average of all your surrounding neighbors. Mm. And so you know where you stand in terms of your consumption level. And that itself is a nudge for you to move towards more efficient consumption. And there below you also give recommendations saying if you're using this particular device, can you switch to a more energy efficient light hmm. or an energy efficient air conditioning and so on. And here I think the, the whole life uh, you know, mission that has been uh, brought about by the PM has some very, very simple steps. You know, there are about 75 steps which are listed there. And they're very straightforward to make changes happen which moves, moves you towards the sustainable pathway. Mm. So I think we've already at UNDP trained people at the state level. These youth are then going into the communities and transferring this message and they're acting as champions for moving towards sustainability. So there are several things that you can do. But if there is one thing that I think we need to do, I would say that, you know, can we go back to the drawing board and start thinking completely out of the box and reimagine what our society needs to look like? Can we prevent increased urbanization by building better infrastructure in rural areas so that there, and also economic opportunities so that people don't feel the need to migrate? So, that would be like a very high level thing, very challenging. Uh, we need to think very differently from Western societies then right. and come up with our own model. And do we have the courage and the will, political will to kind of go down that pathway is the real Okay, so question. an Indian indigenous but utopian future could be possible, but that way. All right, I'd love to thank all three of you for joining us. Thank you, Hari. Yep, we, we've ended now, yeah. Hari, thank you so much. Weber, thank you. And Swapan, thank you for taking out your time and joining us. All right, thank you, audiences, for joining us here. A big thank you to our panelists for sharing their insights, and thank you to Oya for moderating this panel. Clearly, we need to integrate eco-friendly practices into our urban planning, which is required not just for a sustainable future, but also for the well-being of our cities, our communities. Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, now. We are beyond honored to have amongst us Dr. Jitendra Singh, Minister of State for Science and Technology. Ladies and gentlemen, with a huge, huge round of applause, please put your hands together and welcome onto this stage the minister to deliver a very special address. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for having me over here. The Vixit Bharat, driven by green growth. So I think before I say anything else, let's not forget that India on its own and the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, has uh, voluntarily gone ahead to declare and to commit that we are going to be net zero by 2070. So I think that itself is a very honorable commitment and uh, not only that, we also have uh, and we side for ourselves certain milestones, the most uh, significant being the 2030 milestone where we, we look forward to having non-fuel fuel energy 
from as much to the capacity of about 500 gigawatts, which means about half the energy will be from these sources. We also look forward to reducing the carbon dioxide emissions by 1 billion ton and reducing the carbon intensity below 2030, uh, sorry, below 45% by 2030. So what I mean to say is that we are already into it. And I think why the question comes up again and again in our discussions is that we are the mindset is not getting used to it. We still look at ourselves as a nation which is quite, I would not say ignorant, but indifferent. And that's how the West has been looking up to us for many years now. They thought for the, these uh, more uh, uh, apparently sounding sophisticated subjects like clean energy, green hydrogen, climate change, net zero, all these things were alien to Indians and we neither had the aptitude not to human to think about all this because we were beset with our own sources, our, our own set of problems. But a huge transformation has happened in the last nine or ten years after Prime Minister Modi came in. And now we are actually from a nation which was looking forward to other countries to take a lead or to, for the leads or for cues. Now we are in a position where we are offering leads. And I think it has, it has taken tremendous amount of effort, perseverance, hard work, focused, diligent effort to reach that, that kind of a pedestal with evidence and with credibility. And the most notable, I think, uh, events that have happened in very recent past, which have established this is, A, of course, our vaccine story. I, I don't know how many of us have ever realized that we are a country which was hardly known or spoken very seriously about health care. And even not at the government level alone, even at the social level, the cultural level, we were not known to be a nation too much concerned or, or giving very high priority to uh, even curative health or therapeutic health. So if someone fell sick, he waited for something to happen in the hope that he would get well. So if he or she got well, it was mother's blessing. If he or she didn't get well, it was Pishle Janamka Karma. So both ways, it was quite complacent. So just imagine a country like that, a nation like that, today being known as a leader in preventive health care. So we are the nation which came out with the first DNA vaccine for COVID and gave it and gifted it to the rest of the world. So that has established us in a different uh, kind of an image altogether. And the second, of course, is the Chandrayaan, which all of us have celebrated for a country which started off its uh, space journey much, much after the then Soviet Union, the Soviet and the, the USA. And even though the USA had already landed one of its uh, human beings on the surface of the moon in way back in 1969, but it was our Chandrayaan which went there and picked up the evidence of the presence of water molecules, H2O molecules, not the human being who had a stroll around in 1969. So that again established, and that was an eye-opener for the entire world, including some of the premier agencies. So India has now assumed a different kind of a role, a leading role in many of these uh, newer areas of concern. And actually, we have to now get used to that kind of uh, responsibility that has come upon us. The question is, world is ready to be led. Are we ready to lead? Since the mind is not changing, and now three generations later after the colonial rule, I think the sanskar bhi kate, pidi pe badal jata. So that feudal hangover is also over. So we are now coming on our own. So talking about these initiatives, of course, the renewable energy, again, I think one of the very much lesser talked about facts is that India came out with its first solar cell. I'm not sure how many in this room would be able to guess. Way back in 1977, in one of our uh, institutes here at Faridabad, which is incidentally under the control of the Department of Science and Technology, PSU. Uh, also because our priorities were different, our mindset was different, our outlook was different, and I must compliment Anand and the team for having organized an event like this. Well, it wouldn't have been organized in those days. I was telling some of the media person the other day, I said, I bet you dig out the newspapers because that was most, most, it was mostly the 
print media days and try to search. You will not find even a single column news, even in the remotest page of a newspaper, reporting the first solar cell having been developed in India 50 years back. Then they, they, they laughed and said, so how do you say that? So, so much confidence. I said, no, I can also tell you what will be the news. So they looked back in the museum because I keep doing all this kurafati. So I said, the news would be Indira Gandhi dislodged by Maharaji Desai. <laughs> because that was the year when the Janta government took over. So we, we uh, even our, you know, our attitude at all levels, because the nation grows as a whole. So we are just a 75 years, 76 years old nation. So we are still evolving socially, culturally, media-wise, communication-wise, trying to be on our own now gradually, because 75 is a very small span in the age of a nation. I mean, for a, set, for a mortal being, 70 then starts sounding something inside. <laughs> but here, 70 years in the life of a nation do not even occupy the footnote of a chapter of history. So now, this, so the, why I'm saying this, it is India which which undertook this International Solar Alliance. So it was a huge initiative. We, are, we, we have not only moved on from solar panels and solar parks, we are now actually offering cues to the rest of the world as well. Now, National Hydrogen Mission was something which was announced by Prime Minister of the Ramparts of the Red Fort. Now, Independence Day address of a Prime Minister, whoever be the Prime Minister, whichever be the party, is considered to be a declaration of intent of the government in place. So this was spoken there, and the manner in which we are going, we have already come out with the indigenous, first ever indigenous uh, hydrogen bus or hydrogen vehicle. Again, our institute in Pune, the National Chemical uh, Laboratory. Though it was being used over here, but the assembling was happening. Uh, the total indigenous is again uh, from one of the CSIR institutes. And if we move the way we are, I think one day we could be also an exporter of the green hydrogen because for the first time, we have started looking at those sources or those avenues or those sectors which were either hitherto unexplored, underexplored, or which were not enjoying our attention or priority. For example, the, 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 again, the buyer source is lying hugely in the Himalayas. We have at least three or four states lying in the lap of Himalaya. We never looked there. Today, we have the Aroma mission. We have the, the, the Purple Revolution, all those things, and huge biofuels happening over there. The second area is our marine resource. The, we have longest 7,500 kilometer long coastal area, beginning from Odisha down up to Maharashtra, Gujarat, Kutch. The only country which has an ocean named after India. I was telling the other day some friends from Australia, I said you have a country called Australia, you have a continent called Australia, you have an island called Australia, you have the ocean not Australia. Why? Because my ancestors could guess there's a huge amount of wealth underlying there. And that's going to be discovered now both living and non-living. We'll have metals, minerals, and huge amount of bio-resources there. And that also will be another concern also is now cleaning it off of plastic and other things to preserve. So these are some of the resources which are exclusive to India. For the first time, they have started attracting our attention. And once we are able to explore them to the maximum potential, we will certainly gain an edge. When we say of the next 25 years of Amrit Kaal, so we also must contemplate and try to ask ourselves, where is that value addition going to happen? Similarly, the electric vehicles I was just now listening is one of the important answers to reduce the carbon footprint, which we are already into it. The nuclear energy, I think for the, I, we have targeted for ourselves about 9% of contribution to the clean energy from the nuclear sources by 2040. And that, again, a conscious effort has been made by this government. I think in a single cabinet decision, we issued orders for setting up 10 reactors in a single go, which never happened earlier. And also, it's now been allowed to enter into joint ventures, not with the private sector exactly, with the PSUs, maybe later on. But of course, the space has been totally opened up. So we have brought all these stakeholders together so that they can pool in their resources, also be knowledge partners and funding partners. The best example, I think, is the transformation which has happened in the space sector in just about three or four years. The Aditya launching was launched by about 10,000 spectators. The, 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 the earlier launching Chandrayaan by at least 1,000 media persons. So immediately, suddenly there was a tweet, what is new, by one of the opponents. And one of the media persons asked me, 
This is a tweet. What do you have to say? I said, how many times have you come here? He said, first time. I said, that is new. Because we had shut ourselves from all other sources. We were actually living in self-imposed shackles. We have now opened up. So there's a huge synergy between academia, research, startups, industry, and heavily loaded with industry because it's my considered view that the era of silos is over. And if we have to move forward from here, we cannot move in isolation. So it has to be larger the integration, the extended the integration. The recycling, upcycling of the uh, bioresources, biofuels, the waste, the circular economy as it is properly called, is also caught up in a big way. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it get, doesn't receive the kind of reportage that it should. In Dehradun, we have launched a huge campaign. Every evening, we collect used oil and then convert it into fuel. So earlier on, when our institute in Dehradun started this initiative over a year or so back, they started, they used to procure this used oil from the, from the municipal corporations. So I went there because I, I, I'm curious to learn about all these things. So I applied my mind and I suggested to them, they don't collect it from the municipal corporation, collect it from the individual households. They said it will be a little cumbersome. It will be cumbersome. It will generate a mass movement because when you go every day, knock at the door of a housewife and ask her to give used fuel and tell her, hey, Bhenji, isko nali mein mat phengna. Main aunga 20 rupay kilo. Main khari dunga. So, ek din, do din, teen din ke baad, wo puche ki kisi padho si. Ye koon murk hai, jo mujhe kehta hai, nali mein tel mat phengna. Main 20 rupay kilo mein khir dunga. And usse jigyasa paida hogi. So, that's how the, because if we have, when we talk of synergy, we have to talk of the public engagement as well. And that is how the public engagement happens. And we have actually now realized the benefits of it, the citizen participation, and a huge amount of private sector involvement that we look forward to. We've already done that in the most uh, uh, tabooed area of space. And I think we'll have it in large. And of course, without taking long, because I, I know we have to then engage in a conversation. Very recently, G20, we had this global biofuel alliance when we are talking of this, involving Brazil and USA. Now, we know that all these countries are already into biofuels, also the other countries, but that also gives India a legitimate role as a, as a pioneer in this area, just as we took the initiative in International Solar Alliance, so also here. So that now, from here onwards, if we look forward to have a larger role globally, we have to live up to global parameters. Our challenges have to be global. Our strategies have to be global. We have to learn to beat them in their game. Now, we, in sports, for example, we were known for Kabaddi all, all these years. But the world came to know you when you started defeating them in cricket. So you have to learn to play their game and also be up on that. And that's precisely what India has now for the first time started doing in the last eight, nine years. So that's given us tremendous amount of esteem, confidence to scientific fraternity as well as our innovators. And before I conclude, I think what again has not received enough of publicity is very recently what we brought in Parliament, the National Research Foundation legislation called the Anusandhan, which is going to take care of all these issues that I have been speaking about in the last few minutes is going to be heavily loaded by the non-government sources. For example, out of 50,000 crore of uh, budget for the five-year term, we'll have as much as nearly 36,000 from the non-government sources. The Executive Council will not only have presence of scientists, but also the non-scientists in the equal measure. I firmly believe science too serious to be left to scientists alone. As Mark Twain once said for economists, econo economics too serious to be left to economists alone. And we've seen this happening at least before this government came in. But nevertheless, so we have, and I'm sure this foundation when this becomes functional, it will not only engage private sector and the other stakeholders in a big way, it will be a better version of some of the other experiments that have happened in a similar manner, because America was among the first to have a, uh, as a foundation like this, which they call National Research Society. But what makes us apart is that in our executive council, we also have representation not only of industry, which I said is very heavy, also representation from the society, from the humanities, from social sciences, so that we don't lose out our context, the, our, our ethos, and also are, remain relevant to our socio-economic needs and requirements while combining the traditional knowledge with the latest cutting-edge technology. 
So we are going to, in the, I think, times to come, present to the world one of the best models of growth, which is also sustainable, which is also green, which is also likable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. And as you see now, Anand has joined him on the stage because up next we have a very special fireside chat with Dr. Jitendra Prasad, who is the Minister of State for Science and Technology. Let's get it started with the round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Over to you, Anand. Well, he can have the mic. Check. Yeah. Dr. Jitendra Singh, thank you very much. Sir, before we start the conversation, uh, can I just pin this on your lapel? This is the green ribbon and uh, part of the green movement so as a soldier and as a champion for sustainable and green growth with your kind permission. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, many would wonder what is the MOSPMO doing on the Green Ribbon Champions. The reason is that the department that comes under him holds the core for technology or developing the technology that will back the search for clean energy and green energy and also sustainable options. So you talked about the fact that the green hydrogen bus, we had the Indian Oil Chairperson also here at this point. They have promised the rollout of at least 15 buses uh, very soon between Faridabad and Delhi. But you said that the research is happening in Pune and he had made a mention of it. How much of effort is going to be there from us when I say us as a nation, towards research and development. What's been the biggest shift and how much? I think uh, the two parts, two, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, like to address it in two phases. A, that uh, once we have a stake, then the interest develops. Hmm. Like for example, Bioeconomy, now we are talking about the bioeconomy is going to be a hugely lucrative source of livelihood as well in the times to come. And a huge uh, sector of economy. We had just about, by, in 2014, the India's bioeconomy stood at about, uh, just about 10 billion US dollars. Today it is 80 billion. In just eight, nine years, it's gone eight times. And we look forward to having 150 billion dollars by 2025. 20, uh, so, all these resources which had not yet been explored, because you have startups, but how do you sustain them? Because of that startup, after all, is also the son or a daughter of the same society. So if he has to sustain, he has to have hmm. be driving the same car which his peer is driving, even if he's not a startup. So otherwise, he says, "What the hell am I doing over here?" So you have to give him the same kind of uh, comfort level in the terms of living, in the in terms of his, his lifestyle. So when they find that here is a stake associated, then the, the interest generates, the, the, the aptitude for innovation also comes. And the whole thing, as I said, the second part is the, the overall, it all is also gets optimum uh, encouragement if the ecosystem is healthy. And when I talk of ecosystem eco uh, uh, as a whole, I would also mention a component which may not be part of uh, per se, this discussion mm. is the new education policy, which yeah. we thought of National Education Policy 2020. And as when you ask what will be the role of science, actually we, just as we were curtailing our resources, our inputs, our supplementation of both knowledge and funds by, you know, living in a veil of secrecy in the space sector, similarly also our education system was producing innovators by default. Right. See, for example, we, in simple terms, we were making our youth, our citizens, prisoners of the aspiration. You know, your parents want you to be a doctor, so you, you haven't yet exercised your mind on that. So you take up those subjects, bio, etc. Then after class, well, you don't get it. So what do you do? You do BSc in the same subject. Then what do you do? You appear in civil service. If you make it good, if you don't, then what? Then you go in for MSc, same subject. Then after that, what? Then you look for some teaching job in a college, university, because the UGC mm -hmm. also pays you well. As I said, you are children of the same society. You can't be different just because you are a startup. So you don't become holier than thou suddenly overnight. 
Then after MSc, that also you don't, then what do you do? Then you do PhD. Then after that, what do you do? You come to me, become a scientist. <laughs> See, what a paradoxical thing was happening. It was by default. Now we don't have that. I think the, one of the greatest revolution that has been brought in by Prime Minister Modi is the National Education Policy 2020. And it's going to have a bearing on every sector of our lives, even our, our mental well-being. As I said, they will not have citizen or youth who will be living all their life as prisoners of the aspiration which was cultivated by their parents, not even their aspiration. So now we have after class 12, if you are not able to choose or to get into the stream that you wish to, you can change your subject. You combine economics with medical, uh, with biology like that. Hmm. And you can then in the course of time as the youth grows, he or she also begins to realize his inner aptitudes. Like many of us go to Bombay in the hope that I'm very good looking, I'll become a hero or heroine. There I realize, no, it's not so. I have to end up as a script writer at all. Or right. if not, if some clapper boy. Hmm. So that exposure and growth as the child grows or the hmm. youth grows helps her or him to develop that aptitude or no aptitude. Because earlier on, he's victim of what his parents had planned. The parents are usually the first corrupting experience after class uh, 10. Correct. So I think that whole ecosystem has now changed as a result of which we will be getting real innovators who will be innovators from uh, by aptitude, also by their commitment. And that is going to add value to it because the entire growth here after across the world is going to be technology driven. No, but how, how much of a lag is it from research to innovation to scale? So uh, that's the lag, yes. that's where, because yeah. you said, uh, le let's take the case of solar panels. You said 1977, we had developed the first solar panel. 18 to 20 years ago, a small village beyond Giridi in Jharkhand became totally solar powered because there was no electricity there. But even today, Delhi NCR is not powered by solar panels. No, I agree with you. And I think the answer to that is uh, precisely what I was saying in the, uh, in the hmm. response to the earlier question because we didn't have that kind of an ecosystem and an integrated approach. That's why I say we have to have a very healthy synergy of academia, research, startups, industry. And industry right from the beginning. They have to be stakeholders right from the beginning. So, for example, if I'm into solar hmm. innovation, I have to, even if it requires industry to do its mapping, what kind of solar panels do they require? What kind of solar paths do they, do they require or not? And then we move ahead as a team. Hmm. Not that I do something right. and then as I agree with you, from 1977 till now, we are no takers. Correct. Because the, 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 other, the others who could use it or even the industry or the other stakeholders were not sensitized enough. That is why National Research Foundation will take care of that. I, wish, I think it's an opportunity for me to share with you this uh, learned audience that in the National Research Foundation will also act as a think tank. It has the mandate of even deciding the themes on which the projects have to be undertaken and funded, depending on the requirement of the futuristic visions, projections, B, also in the terms of international collaborations. So, so far what was happening is that many of the collaborations happen for diplomatic reasons, not strictly for scientific reasons. Correct. So we sign an MOU and we have hundreds of MOUs. So this body will also decide and work upon what kind of collaboration with which country which help us or help mutually. So we'll have a more scientific approach so that I agree with you, the innovation doesn't get lost in the, in the mm. passage of time. And when, when, when it doesn't pick up, then it doesn't move on. So same it is what happened with the solar. Hmm. It, was, right. it, was, it, it, it came to be known in 77, and, but it got lost hmm. till it, it was rediscovered because then we found the constraints of having the other sources of energy not being very healthy with a compatible lifestyle. So we have to have a unified and integrated approach and rather I would say extended, even for, I was suggesting even to a, a group of medicos that day, we now is the term when we have to integrate the engineering and medical. Hmm. I've done a very successful experiment, doctor on wheels, the telemedicine, in some of the remotest villages in my constituency, and this become a lucrative health startup career. Well, for 60 villages, we had to pay about 50, 70 lakh. Of course, I didn't charge my constituents. It was uh, done out of philanthropy. But the entire exercise was conducted by non-medicals. Three youngsters, good in IT, they would do the entire screening of the patient. They had tied up with a hospital in Ahmedabad, one in Bengaluru. Hmm. 
and then get engaged and provide the prescription. So, so, so it's a, it's a, now extended integration. It's not only... In fact, Aditya, if you recall, I mean, mm. we were corrected that day. When yeah. I was asked to make the official announcement of Aditya having been successfully launched, my first sentence was, the mission, the, the launching is by ISRO, but the mission is whole of science. Because right. so much of contribution has happened from everywhere. And now also from industry. From, that was my, uh, that's going to be my last question. We've just got about one minute on the clock. Uh, there are two parts to it. How much of this green growth, this push for net zero by 2070, or let's say even by 2050, if there is very aggressive, is dependent on political stability and the political continuum, first part. And the second part is the private corporate India partnership and participation, both factors. Yeah. Yeah, to take up the second one first, because that's easier. <laughs> the, the point is that we are already into it. And uh, a fanciful term has been called, called green financing. Hmm. Not that the notes will be put in, will be green color. The financing will be also neat and clean. So green financing with a larger industrial involvement and industry involvement right from the beginning, because it's my considered view, I firm believe, you cannot, you cannot move beyond hmm. certain point. Like we had stagnated ourselves in the space sector, and suddenly there's a quantum jump. So it will be heavy involvement of industry, and the National Research Foundation, Anusandan, will also address that issue. And B, of course, stability is there. It's prime, because of Prime Minister Modi, he's, he's successfully given us a stable political dispensation. The world is looking up to us. Hmm. And this stability is going to continue, and the evidence of that is that the officers and the other countries continue to relate to us with the same vigor, even in the last few months of the term. <laughs> Which means they're so confident of this stability being there in place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jitendra Singh. We'll, we'll take this question further, where we wanted to say that beyond political ideologies, is the growth story, the thought continuum going to be appre appreciated? Is it going to be bipartisan? I, I, think, I think just to add to that, that with your permission, is that there is no option now left. Uh -huh. If we have to grow, we have to go collectively, whether we like it or not. Right. I mean, it's just like a bus breaks down and everybody has to push it hard. The driver says push it. No, I, I may not like your face, but I ask, ask you, thoda sa laga do. So, our entire growth now is going to be collective. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jitendra Singh, thank you so much, sir. Sir, I'm going to request you to please uh, stay with us on the stage. We have a few awards for our Green Ribbon Champions. Thank you, Dr. Jitendra Singh, and thank you, Anand, for that enriching conversation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, that we have the minister with us, Anand is with him on the stage. Let's get on and get into the next set of felicitations for the Green Ribbon Champions. Please put your hands together as we get down to felicitating the category Green Bank of the Year, and this one going out to Bank of Baroda. We have Sri Rakesh Sharma, General Manager and Zonal Head, New Delhi Zone, Bank of Barota here to receive the felicitation. Huge congratulations, Bank of Baroda. Moving on to the next category, which is Green Public Sector Organization, and this one's going out to Canara Bank. We have Sri Bhavendra Kumar, Chief General Manager, Canara Bank here with us to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations to Canara Bank. And now the next category is CSR Green Initiative of the Year. And this one goes out to Punjab National Bank. We have Sri Devarchan Sahu and Sri Manish Agarwal, General Manager, Punjab National Bank here to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations, Punjab National Bank. Moving on to the next category, which is Green Ally of the Year. This felicitation goes out to State Bank of India, LHO Guwahati Circle. 
We have Sri Amresh Kumar Jha, General Manager, State Bank of India, Elijah Bahati Circle here to receive the felicitation. Many congratulations to you. And next up, let's hear it up for the recipient of felicitation in the category, which is Outstanding Waste Management Initiative of the Year. And the felicitation goes out to, ladies and gentlemen, Indian Navy. We have Commodore Samir Singh Chaudhary, Principal Director, Commodore Marine Engineering, Indian Navy here to receive the felicitation. Can we have a mic here on stage, please? Can we have a handheld mic on stage quickly? That, that reminds me that when I saw him, as we were just now discussing the, 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 the requirement of having a wider integration and synergy, the Gaganyan, which incidentally didn't find a mention in our conversation, is going to be one of the most ambitious missions from the space sector in the history of the times to come. We'll also have involvement of the Indian Navy because when the human being comes back, it's equally important to rescue him back and bring him back safe as important it is to send him up. So the journey, return journey and safe return will also be partnered by the Indian Navy. Many congratulations to Green Ribbon Champion Indian Navy for receiving felicitation as Outstanding Waste Management Initiative of the Year. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, is Excellence in Plastic Waste Management and the felicitation goes to Indian Coast Guard. We have Sri Rajesh Mittal, DIG Indian Coast Guard here to receive the felicitation. Since it's a green conversation, so the Coast Guard needs a very special mention. I was about to say it myself, but Minister Saab is saying it, so please. No, I think what uh, we were talking about, the integrated synergized approach is finding evidence again and again through the price distribution. Now, Coastal Guards, I must acknowledge, we had the world's longest uh, ocean cleaning campaign last year, coastal cleaning. As I mentioned, 70 high, 500 kilometer long, 75 locations, and for 75 days to commemorate 75 years of independence. And Coastal Guard was a great help. The, when we culminated on the 17th of September 2022, and then had a kind of a small celebrated ceremonial cleaning sessions in most of the famous beaches, like Juhu Beach, Marine Beach, Iliad Beach, we didn't have anything to clean. So I think that's a great compliment for the Coast Guard. Many congratulations to the Indian Coast Guard. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the last felicitation, and that is in the category Excellence in Sustainable Tourism. And this one goes out to Government of Karnataka. We have Sri H.P. Janardhan, Joint Director, Department of Tourism, Government of Karnataka here with us to receive the felicitation. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Anand. And let's hear a huge round of applause for all the Green Ribbon Champions for their commitment for a greener future. We request all of you to kindly take your seats. We request all our guests at the back to kindly take the seat so that we can resume and move on towards the next panel discussion of this evening. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our next session is titled Future of Fossil Fuels Transitioning to a Carbon Neutral World. Now, as society's appetite for a cleaner energy grows, the fossil fuel industry must adapt renewable energy sources like wind, solar and hydroelectric power offer a path forward, reducing carbon emissions and environmental impact. Investment in green technologies, carbon capture and energy efficiency are just extremely essential to ensure this transition. To take this conversation forward, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming onto the stage the moderator for this session, CNN News 18's Akanksha Swaroop. A very warm welcome to you, Akanksha. And please join me in welcoming our esteemed panelists for this panel, starting with Dr. Akhilesh Gupta, Senior Advisor and Secretary of the Science and Engineering Research Board, Department of Science Technology. We're also being joined by Nitin Bassi, Senior Program Lead, Council on Energy, Environment and Water. And we're very glad to have with us for this panel, Sushma Rawat, Director, Exploration, ONGC. Thank you to all the panelists for making time and joining us for this discussion. Over to you. Thank you so much, Shritika. So for the benefit of our audience and our distinguished panelists, I'd like to elaborate on what we are going to delve into. Our discussion today will, in fact, try and... Uh, explore how India can harmonize productivity and sustainability. Also, what is the progress of our global commitment to climate change? And of course, through a special focus on the national hydrogen mission. Uh, if I could begin with you, Sushma ji. Uh, it was at the 26th session of COP26 back in 2021 that Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, made this commitment that India will achieve its target of net zero uh, emissions by the year 2070. At the same time, we are standing at a very crucial juncture, you see, because we are also ranked seventh on the Global Climate Risk Index. Where does that place India? Of course, I want to know how you weigh in on that target of 2017, keeping our industrial progress and development needs in mind. Uh, namaskar and a very uh, good evening to the esteemed panel here, all the guests and uh, for uh, CNBC Network uh, 18 to organize this. Uh, coming directly to the question which you have put, of course, uh, COP26 and uh, Honorable Prime Ministers, target for India being declared as 2070. Uh, we in uh, ONGC, that, that is the Oil and Natural Gas Corporation, we initially started as, uh, uh, you know, the providers of energy requirement of the nation way back in 1956 with the first discovery of oil coming in 1959. So it's been more than six, six decades of oil and gas search or quest, I would say. But slowly down the line, because uh, the ENP company, uh, half of the uh, ONGC's efforts, they go in uh, trying to understand uh, the uh, subsurface, the Mother Earth in our quest. So I think uh, along with oil and gas, the knowledge of oil and gas, what we have come to discover or come to know, it is what is there in the subsurface in terms of the minerals, in terms of the reservoirs, in terms of the other forms of energy. So uh, with 2070 being the target for the nation, ONGC has declared its net one, uh, scope one and scope two in 2030 uh, and 2038. So uh, right now, along with fossil fuels, what we have also started the vertical for renewables in which uh, initially, like everyone else, and uh, solar being the easiest option, so we have already established uh, 
some uh, solar plants uh, starting from our assets in Rajasthan. So, and uh, the uh, uh, target for us is around uh, five gigawatt of solar energy. Of course, because we are in the offshore also and we have done a lot of studies. So the LIDAR surveys where the intensity of the wind is high in the offshore areas and also because of the installations of ONGC which are in the offshore, the platforms, right. the harnessing of uh, offshore energy becomes another thing. Then we are into geothermal as well. We already have started one well in the Puga Valley in Ladakh. Mm -hmm. We have assessed the uh, geothermal potential of the entire country because uh, along with the drilling of the wells, we get to know what is the geothermal gradient in various parts of the country in different sedimentary basins. So around 10,500 gigawatt uh, approximate potential has been, uh, you know, envisaged. And we are going pretty strong with it. Uh, we have come uh, with an MOU with uh, the government of Iceland. So uh, we will be coming up with a lot of uh, uh, wells for geothermal uh, extraction. Then, right. of course, uh, uh, the green uh, hydrogen is another initiative that has right. been taken. We will be delving yeah. into green uh, hydrogen as well. But let me also come to Dr. Gupta. Dr. Gupta, this is an extremely ambitious target when we look at 2070. We are 20 years behind 2050, 10 years behind Russia and China's target. But how do you weigh in? And so how can the government and private sector sort of build an ecosystem to achieve that target of 2070? Thank you, Akanksha ji. This is a very, very debatable issue. And uh, it's not just a statement guy or prime minister. There has been a lot of debate before these announcements were made. And in fact, it's not that simple to achieve this thing. The, the other components of Panchangrit are, in fact, easily achievable because India is already working on very aggressively in that area. But to achieve net zero by 2070 means a lot. Right. And this is, I think, the tallest order that the country like India can have. And given the different, different geopolitical situation across the globe and also within the country, we are facing with so many other issues. Poverty is an issue. We have the population is an issue. 2070 net zero means nearly 15 times increase in the renewable energy of today's level. In, we reduce substantial reduction of coal uh, use and substantial reduction of crude oil. Uh, again, I would say India traditionally has been on the, has so much of coal reserves, so we are again depending on the coal uh, energy. Uh, so thermal energy has been our mainstay, but now switching over from thermal to renewable is a big challenge. Although, we have been making a good efforts, and uh, in fact, we have become the fourth largest in renewable energy. Do throw light on those efforts. So, you know, uh, so for example, I'll tell you, uh, our, as far as the nationally determined contributions announcement by India, we made certain announcements uh, three years back, uh, but in fact, our achievement as on date is much more than what we had committed. And let me tell you, India is not obligatory to make any uh, international, uh, internationally any obligation to commit any re uh, reduction in emission. Despite that, India has committed as part of nationally determined contribution. And for example, we are supposed to, uh, you know, have uh, certain targets for the uh, solar energy. We achieve much before this thing. Now we are targeting, in fact, uh, something like uh, 175 gigawatt of uh, renewable energy by 2030 and so. I think uh, India track has been very good. We have a renewable energy addition annually to the tune of 12 percent, uh, in, in right. 10 to 8, 12 percent, which is one of the best in the world, you know. 
So we are earning, I'm not saying that we uh, are not on the right track, but to achieve net zero by 2070, much more need to be done. And I just want to add when you, your question says that, you know, government alone cannot achieve this. Because this would need participation of private sector in a big way. Already part of the private sector is participation, participating in the renewable energy, for example, in the wind energy, in the, uh, in the area of uh, uh, solar, and also in the hydrogen mission recently, I think participation of private sector, mm -hmm. EV uh, private sector is coming so well. And now in the new area like carbon capture and storage or carbon capture and uh, utilization area, private sectors are coming well. So I would, uh, a lot can be contributed by private sectors. Government and private must work together. So this is a new kind of model is evolving or uh, working together by private and public. Absolutely. This is something that will have to come up like an ecosystem between private uh, and public partnership. Uh, Mr. Basti, if I could come to you. When we talk about decarbonization or going carbon neutral, the role of water is of course pertinent and very crucial, which is why I come to you as the lead person for uh, energy, environment and water from CEEW. You will be able to help me understand better in terms of uh, the kind of stress that uh, or when it comes to operations in the field of oil and gas, we've seen the kind of uh, hydrological alterations that have taken place due to climate change. So. Is there any scope for water conservation over there? And how can India strengthen its water security? Uh, thank you, Akanksha, for the uh, question and also for uh, having us here. Uh, well, uh, let me make an effort to summarize this in the three minutes that I might have. Uh, well, uh, for the administrative regions, uh, we have, uh, you know, called it state boundaries, district boundaries, blocks. When we talk about water, uh, we have hydrological boundaries, uh, which we call as watershed, sub-basins, river basins. So whole country is divided into different river basins. And uh, if I pick up the 15 major river basins in the world, or sorry, in India, what we see is that as soon as by 2025, almost 11 of them will be facing water stress. Uh, and now what it means for the industrial sector and especially those uh, sectors or those uh, industrial, uh, let's say, units where water is the main requirement. So oil uh, sector, I mean, especially the exploration and production is the major consumer of water. Uh, thermal power plants, they are again a major consumer of water. So what they can do? Uh, I mean, water use efficiency has been heard a lot. I mean, of course, uh, across industry, agriculture, even for the domestic water supplies, we have to make effort to improve it. Specifically, uh, the other thing which needs to be done is to bring in circularity in the way we use our water, uh, which basically means that whatever water we think is not usable, how we can make use of it. So if I specifically talk about uh, uh, oil and exploration, uh, oil and gas exploration and production, which you uh, wanted to know, uh, a lot of time when we are doing this exploration, there is a lot of uh, excess energy which is also generated in the form of heat and uh, steam. And that can be used to co-generate electricity. Now, why it is important from the water angle? Because if that co-generation is not happening, uh, then we are dependent on uh, fossil fuel-based electricity, uh, which needs sure. a lot of water. And uh, so that is how we are also reducing pressure on water if we are entering into cogeneration. Similarly, a uh, lot of time uh, when we are doing uh, exploration, uh, we get groundwater from the aquifers, deep aquifers. Uh, it has, uh, you know, sulfide content in it. Now, many countries, uh, they are making an effort to remove the sulfide and then reusing uh, that water for drilling operations. And not only this, because we are talking about green uh, hydrogen, so for green hydrogen, one of the important ingredients, I would say, is water. And uh, of course, land. So if such oil fields have excess land with them, the same water can also be used for the green hydrogen production. But land has a huge role to play. And L finding that kind of land, exactly. I'm sure Sushmaji will also agree. 
yeah so i will stop here and maybe uh, we can uh, carry on the discussion Sushma in the next phase since we are also a country with the largest population in the world the transportation sector has a huge role to play and that's why i want to know from you whether it's ethanol blended petrol or compressed bio uh, biogas what are those sustainable alternatives to clean fuel uh, when we talk about promoting greater mobility and preserving the level of logistics that we've seen in this country as far as the transportation sector is concerned so i'll just take some time answering you know the requirement of oil, uh, water for oil and gas uh yes we are very aware of it and uh, but i'm also happy to say that in lot of our uh, of course because there's a lot of uh, con uh, you know supervision by the pollution control boards of different states uh there is a lot of effort which has been put for the effluent uh, treatment and the recycling of uh, you know the drilling fluid which brings up the cuttings and keeps the drill bit and the pipes uh, cool so we uh, are recycling uh, the uh, treated water and also uh, when i was in the northeast uh, for two years the csir institute uh we have sponsored a project which is all uh, for two years in which we are going to use nano membranes for trying to treat this kind of a water and then bring it on a commercial scale besides that there are a lot of efforts uh, for uh, water treatment and i absolutely agree because uh, you know in assam when i was working uh, i came to know there is one district or one part of the district near uh, golaghat they said it's a drought declared area and for me it came as a shock because in assam we always used to think there's a lot of rain so water i mean uh, having drought situations but again that is watershed management which sir was talking about coming to biofuels we have around seven uh, institutes r&d institutes within uh, ongc and especially with the exploration so one of the institutes is focusing on biofuels uh as you are aware initially we started with uh, you know the uh, husk of the paddy or the sugar cane molasses but uh, we uh, have sponsored a lot of uh, and again this is industry academia interface we have sponsored a lot of projects with the iits uh, pan iit projects as well as with different universities and i'm just happy to tell you that one of the projects it's already a success at the laboratory stage uh, with the iit roorkee in which we are uh, we were able to convert not only the cellulosic part of the uh, biomass and this is not uh, any uh, specific biomass you can take any kind of a biomass either from the uh, agricultural or uh, waste which comes from the municipal Uh, this thing bio waste or uh, forestry and uh, it is not only uh, the cellulose but the hemicellulose which is converted leading to more uh, ethanol generation and the cost of it is quite quite low it is one of the comparables we've already done this and we have put in two patents for that so biofuels is one area uh, and i think uh, what uh, the honorable uh, minister sapuri was also yes, highlighting was the same we and are going to reach hopeful. much before that yes and he's also highlighted how car engines have in fact already reached there yes, yes. i'd like to come to dr gupta dr gupta when we're talking about powering india's green hydrogen ecosystem tell us more about the national hydrogen mission and what has been its impact on a uh, sort of renewable energy sector okay thank you i can check if you allow me to just i will just upon one minute on sure, water issue so as long issue. as we finish within yeah, time yeah so i'll just take one minute on that that you see water is, is one of the impacts of climate change is going to be uh, the increase in frequency and intensity of extreme weather events which means there going to be more warming and more uh, rainfall and both will create a stress condition more uh, warming in more dryness and so more drought condition and more rainfall in more flood condition so when uh, sushma ji was telling you know flood and drought in in assam is not very uh, common is not very common but normally it is flood there but i think these things is going to increase in india and both will put a stress on water availability and water quality and ultimately it will put a stress on the energy requirement of the country true so this is the connection that climate change will have with all this component now coming to the 
green hydrogen. So as I mentioned that we, uh, in, in fact, India is kind of making all the strategies to create a, a good mix of non-fossil energy with the, uh, the availability of the coal-based energy, that is your thermal energy. Now, this will require a lot of phasing out of coal energy, but a lot of efforts to create more renewable energy or non-fossil energy. Uh, hydrogen is one area that India is making a good effort. So the National Green Hydrogen Mission that had been launched last year, we are progressing well. Uh, the, uh, the target is that we create 5 million metric tons of hydrogen every year, which will create uh, you know, uh, a, a very good mix with the uh, the other uh, option. But the challenge of with hydrogen is that it requires a very different uh, kind of condition for storage, production, storage, and transportation. All the three are critical. I think Honorable Minister mentioned about uh, our National Chemical Regulatory uh, setting up in, in hydrogen gas, and it was also made trial. But you know, the big challenge was that the, in, the, uh, uh, still the, the uh, necessary con, uh, permissions to run such gases because they, can, they need to be run safe. So transportation of hydrogen is a big issue. So those things are inside being created and so hopefully that the ecosystem will be favorable maybe in the next few years you find that it will be easier to, to have transportable uh, uh, vehicles with hydrogen. This is the thing that we are doing. I think it will, research has already evolved. The demonstration has already been done. Prototype have already been set up. Now it has to go to market with a full crook safety measures. That's an aspect that Anand also highlighted while speaking to Dr. Singh as well. Uh, Mr. Basti, as we all know, due to climate change, there's been a lot of uh, water stress on river basins. I want to know from you, how is that impacting industrial operations, A, and the human species is as such that till you do not teach them what the consequences can be, they will not learn. So important to also talk about what inaction can cost us if timely action is not taken and what will be the repercussions in future. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to highlight, if we look at last two decades, uh, you know, in the last two decades, wherever the disasters have happened across the world, 75% uh, of them were water-related. So, which means they were either floods, droughts, or cyclones. And uh, it is not that, you know, only some specific zones have been impacted. You know, if, if we look at the number of such events across the world, so the three main, uh, you know, countries which have been impacted is, of course, U.S., uh, India, and China. And this is also where we have uh, suffered uh, losses in terms of uh, life, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of livelihoods. Uh, now, developed countries were able to cope up because they are already at advanced stage of development. Uh, countries like us, you know, we have to uh, deal with, uh, you know, a lot of uh, population that we need to support. We need to uh, create a lot of uh, livelihood and ensure the livelihood is there. We need to be uh, careful also about the food security. So th there are limits, uh, you know, to what we can do in various sectors. Having said that, uh, especially uh, because, again, uh, the focus is on industry. So if I look at the water usage in India, so almost 80% of it is used for irrigation in agricultural operation. 20% is what industries and uh, the water supply uh, for domestic uses is being uh, taken up. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, uh, that water use efficiency improvement is one of the aspects. Uh, but the focus has to be in the agriculture sector uh, because we see that the growth in irrigated areas is anyways, you know, uh, kind of a now uh, plateauing. So we don't see, uh, you know, much growth unless and until more infrastructure facilities are created, which means that if we make water use efficient in agriculture sector, we'll be making more water available for manufacturing industries and also for water supply. And these are the two sectors where we will see 
uh, growth in water demand in the coming years. Uh, we have so many initiatives lined up. Uh, we have uh, 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 Jal Jeevan Mission, which is reaching out to each and every household. So demand for water is going to go up in these two sectors. And if we don't uh, do this efficiency improvement in agriculture, as per one of the studies that we have done at CEW, we see that we are, you know, it, it's going to cost us around uh, 2,500 uh, billion US dollars in inaction, uh, especially because we won't be able to meet uh, the growing demand from the manufacturing and uh, from the domestic uh, side of it. And considering their contribution to the G GDP in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the money it generates per cubic meter of water they consume, it is much, much higher uh, than any other sector. And that is why this big figure uh, which we see. So I, I would again emphasize it is important uh, that we consider the, the climate-driven changes uh, that we'll be experiencing. But at the same time, I think we need to prepare ourselves better. And there have been several initiatives. It's just that we, need, we are still or yet to reach the scale that we intend to reach. All right. And that's why I want to come to India's leadership role when it comes to its own commitment towards renewable energy, clean fuel. Uh, Sushma ji, if I could bring you in on this aspect, do you reckon that India, when we say, has emerged as the voice of the global south, that also includes its commitment to climate action? Because so far, if you look at the UNFCC or Kyoto Protocol or Paris Agreement, they have been West-led pacts. What India has done this year during its G20 presidency by launching the Biofuel Alliance, not to forget that solar energy has already been taken to a global level through the International Solar Alliance. How do you see India's role uh, globally when it comes to um, taking on the challenge of climate action? Yeah, I, I think uh, when it comes to uh, starting something anew or taking something afresh, we... Uh, as India, we are a little slow. But I think once it gets, what we understand what the concept is, uh, it grows exponentially. Uh, I mean, of course, one uh, live example is the ethanol blending, which we had. We had our targets. We are, in fact, we have achieved them, and uh, we are well on our way to, uh, uh, you know, overachieving those targets. Uh, the series within the, even the uh, so-called fossil fuel industry uh, is very uh, intense, and the commitments in terms of the uh, finances which has been committed to the renewables has been, you know, uh, quite a good amount. Uh, for us, within ONGC, we have committed around 2 lakh crores to uh, reach our scope 2. Uh, 80,000 crores by 30, uh, 2030, and uh, by uh, 2038, we, we'd be spending so much. And there's so much more, uh, this thing in it. Uh, for India, uh, you know, because this is a concentrated and an integrated effort, and once the voice uh, uh, has been, or the clarion call has been given by the highest office uh, of the nation, it has been taken very positively, and I have been interacting because I also look after the carbon management and sustainability for ONGC. So I have noticed that there has been, you know, one is the awareness, the other is the realization that we have to, you know, uh, like because of so many environment-related uh, things which are coming up, we have to convert. And uh, uh, the third thing is that uh, it also, I think, uh, the another reason why we are going for more renewables within India, we are an energy importing country right now. The indigenous uh, uh, oil and gas which is uh, produced, it just caters to around 17 to 18 percent of our right. own requirement. So we need, there is a huge gap for the energy, uh, other energies to fill up. And uh, if we can do well in those sectors and become self-reliant, you know, it, it's strategically very, very important for India as well. Right, and I do so, hope that we do that because, uh, Mr. Bassi, um, if you look at climate crisis, surprisingly and rather ironically, it's also playing out in colonial lines because it is the global south which is bearing the brunt of climate change, heat wave, droughts, crop failures, floods. How can India lead the way forward when it comes to addressing these issues? I think uh, one of the important points uh, here to highlight is I think we have to move from protection to prevention. Uh, you know, a lot of the times it is like what we do after the event has happened. 
So this is called as uh, you know protection uh, uh, way of uh, handling things. We need a preemptive strike. Yeah. So uh, what we need to do is we need to enter into a prevention mode. And uh, what the first step here would be to understand where those risk lies. You know, where that climate risk lies, where the water risk lies, where the agricultural risk lies. And at CEW, we're in the process of uh, coming out uh, with the Pan-India Atlas, uh, which looks at uh, the block level such risk, which is doing the uh, risk assessment at the block level. And how it can be helpful? It can be helpful in targeting interventions better. So, for example, uh, we have seen in, in some of our research that we are doing that a lot of the time, uh, whenever we make any intervention, either uh, you know to uh, uh, build more resilience or adaptation uh, within the community, the target lines or the target areas are actually not the ones who are actually facing those risks on a regular right. and more frequent uh, intervals. So I think once such risk assessment is done at a granular level, uh, taking into uh, consideration uh, climate, water, agriculture, because these are the natural bases which are, uh, you know, important for any sector you talk about. Uh, we can target our intervention better and uh, probably uh, we'll be in a better position uh, to face uh, the disasters or, or probable uh, uh, disasters which may, we may encounter in future. Right. I'd like your closing thoughts, Dr. Gupta, as we come to the end of this discussion. Um, there's a lot of debate about phasing down versus phasing out of fossil fuel. And there's also a sort of unspoken battle between the developed countries versus the underdeveloped and developing ones. Yeah. Um, and something we also witnessed during the G20. So how do you see um, this shaping up now? Shouldn't there be greater onus on the industrialized economies to sort of help the developing economies through greater and better climate finance? So thank you, Akaksha, for asking this uh, important question. Uh, I have been witnessing the negotiation vote at the UNSCCC and the discussion at uh, IPCC for the last more than two decades. And I've seen the kind of transition taking place. Global discussions and debates have been changing. Uh, India has always been uh, kind of debating and taking, uh, uh, you know, always being, I would say, avoiding discussion on, uh, on emissions earlier and focusing on uh, adaptation. But, you know, last one decade has witnessed that India also be going aggressive in, in debating on, the, on the, uh, the, the issue or the thing. Now, one issue that uh, you mentioned that how, whether it is cutting down or, or, or it is uh, doing emission reduction, is a very interesting view. So India, you know, as part of the National Action Plan, and I have been part of the National Action Plan right from the time it was created, we said that India will not do emission reduction rather than it will create an avoided emission path where, you know, so that is how the energy efficiency has been brought into the thing. Right. You see these fluorescent girls and all, with the same luminescence of power, their power, uh, you know, the, the total power consumption is less. So we are using all kind of, we started this CFL and now we are going for much more advances. So we are uh, uh, kind of debating on redu not reducing the emission, but trying to avoid the emission and the thing. And the, the way forward for uh, the adaptation is that we create a resilient society by, you know, reducing the losses. India loses annually more than 1% of the GDP through disasters. How do we reduce that loss by, you know, as Mr. Gassi mentioned, we must create better preparedness system rather than uh, prevention at the later on. So that is the way forward for India. Very well said. Many thanks to you, Dr. Gupta, Mr. Bassi, and Ms. Rawat. It was a pleasure to have you here at Green Ribbon Champions. Together we can build a sustainable and environmentally responsible future. Thank you so much. A big thank you to all the panelists for contributing to the panel with their expertise and their insights. And thank you so much, Akanksha, for moderating the panel. 
Moving on, ladies and gentlemen, is our next panel discussion, which is titled Sustainability Trailblazers, Enabling a Greener Tomorrow, inspiring us to reimagine our relationship with the planet, to create a world where ecological balance thrives, leaving a legacy of hope and inspirations for generations to come. To take this conversation forward, please join me in welcoming onto the stage the moderator of this panel, CNN News 18's Toya Singh. Welcome back, Toya. Please keep it going for the panelists of this panel, starting with Pradeep Sangwan, Healing Himalayas. Thank you for joining us. Please welcome Kriti Tulla, co-founder, Doodle Edge. Welcome, Kriti. And we're also glad to have amongst us Divya Hegere, UN Women Awardee and UNESCO Green Citizen. Thank you to all the panelists for making time for the panel. Thank you for joining us. Over to you, Toya. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you've stayed with us so far. Our next panel, uh, I have hopes, is going to be quite exciting because we are now moving from policymakers, we're speaking to three founders. These are three founders who've crafted for themselves three very, very, and I know we say this in every panel, but three very individual parts. Um, each of you work in an organization. I'm going to give the audiences a quick summary of what each of your organizations do, what you've done. But after that, I'm going to need each of you to go into more depth. We're going to come to you first, Pradeep. Pradeep, you run an organization called Healing Himalayas. Uh, when I told a friend who's a mountaineer that I was going to speak to you, he said, how does he deal with the mountains and mountains of trash and the fact that it doesn't seem to be coming to an end anytime soon? Pradeep essentially runs an organization that organizes volunteers on the Himalayas to collect waste. You also work with local communities, I believe. Pradeep, tell us more about your journey to this point first. So tell us more about how you decided to do this, for example. Well, I started very small back in 2014 when I used to trek without a purpose. I happened to meet, you know, one of the most amazing communities called Shepherds, and I, you know, fortunately stuck with them for a few days and sort of realized what kind of lifestyle they have. And I compared that lifestyle with the, you know, trekkers, the young generation, the people who take a break from the metro city and come down to the mountains for sort of stress buster kind of a trip. But the disparity between both the communities was amazing. Like one community who is in love with the mountains, sort of their dependency is on the complete ecosystem around them. And, you know, they take care of the environment, the, the natural ecosystem around them. But the, on, on the contrary, when we see the youngsters who are coming in, they come in with a lot of demand. They leave a lot of, uh, you know, biggest amount of carbon footprint behind. And nobody is there to sort of, you know, understand and keep it neat and clean. So... I thought, why not create a bridge between the both, both the communities and sort of make a platform wherein people who want to give back to the Himalayas, who want to give back to the you know, natural ecosystem of our beautiful uh, third pole of the world, how can we sort of create that bridge? And that's where, we, I, that's where I, you know, sort of created this campaign called Healing Himalayas, people who want to track, travel for a purpose, who want to visit pilgrimages, not because Bhagawan se baat kuch chahiye hai, but Bhagawan ki jaghe ko saaf bhi karke hai. So, wo sab cheeze ki, and then eventually Healing Himalayas came into the picture. That's just a start. There's a long story behind it, lots of struggle that we'll share later. We'll, we'll get to that because I do want us to talk about that. So, my hope of today's discussion is that for anyone who's watching right now, whether from here or from home, I want you to leave with a blueprint of how you can do this for yourself. Kriti, I want to come to you next. You run Doodledge, and what you do essentially, if I can just give a quick summary to our audiences, is you upcycle industrial waste, you turn it into wearable fashion, and there's a process involved there in separating the kind of fabrics, deciding what you do with it, it's an entire infrastructure. Your journey took you abroad. It took you to London, I believe. It got you back here. Can you tell us more about it? Um, I'm a fashion graduate. So uh, essentially, in your first year of college, you start uh, interning. And uh, you know, when you join, a fa join the fashion industry, you're very excited about being a part of design, the culture, the aesthetic. You know that you're, going, you're inspired and you want to create. 
But as soon as you join the industry, you realize that there's so much that already exists. There's so much that has already been created and we are creating more and more every day. We produce about 120 billion clothes every year, even today. And there are so many resources that go into making each of the garments that we wear. Even today, I you know, hang out with people, friends, other communities where they still don't want to go to the same event, where, to different events, wearing the same clothes. And that is still a culture or that is still a thought. But they, because over the years, as a part of the fashion industry, we have made it a point to make people um, stay away from what goes into making fashion. How many resources are consumed to make cotton? How many resources are consumed to make silk, viscose, leather, wool, your traditional material? And the impact that it directly has on climate change. And now, you know, back in 2012, when I started researching a lot more about it, when I got a chance to be in London um, and work with global, uh, you know, conversations, organizations who were talking about sustainability at the time, and India wasn't. So I was determined to come back. Um, I'd already registered Doodlet by that time, but I was determined to come back and uh, do more with what I had started in India, uh, a conversation around sustainability and the need for sustainable clothing. Mm. Um, and the in 2014, fashion industry was going through major changes. Online fashion was just coming in, and India was just beginning to consume. And here there was a brand called Doodledge who was starting the conversation to not consume, mm -hmm. do not go down the path. Uh, so we weren't very welcomed, clearly. But, um, and we had to build our own supply chain at that time. Like you said, that you know, there's a whole process. Uh, we couldn't just walk into export houses and ask them to declare their waste and ask them for their waste for us to convert that into something else. So there were a lot of connections and conversations that led into finding a supply chain that allowed us to upcycle waste that is uh, discarded by the fashion industry because I understood that there were already so many resources that have gone into making that material, but that is discarded just on the basis of very small defects in the material, which the consumer doesn't care about, but this really hyped um, industry cares a lot about that precision, that perfection, mm. which led to so much waste. So we started consuming that, and then over the years we have worked with recycling uh, units, weaving recycled material back on hand looms and power looms. We've also uh, explored alternate materials. There's a whole supply chain of people who make the clothes, and how do we work to change their lifestyles? So we then started partnering with vendors who were working with fair wages, with artisans, with NGOs, et cetera. So it was a very long journey, mm. but it was a very uh, fun journey. Uh, it's, uh, it's challenging, but uh, it uh, makes you want to keep doing what you're doing every day. We're going to touch on that in a second, because that question of how to keep optimism alive is, is a big one. I want to ask you, Divya, you run Beiru. You have a journey that, I think it's fair to say, especially currently, is one that has centered around coastal communities. You started with Udipi in Karnataka. You went to Chicago. You've come back now. Your journey, if I were to summarize it for our audiences, is, and especially what Beiru does right now, am I correct in summarizing? Because I know they're doing so many things. But am I correct in summarizing that one of your key goals is empowering coastal women, particularly in waste collection, but also in giving themselves a livelihood? Is that the right way to summarize the vast umbrella of what you're doing? Um, yeah, I, more than saying empowering, I would say we are leveraging coastal women as a powerful ally. I know that the general narrative is let's empower women, um, you know, they need to uh, elevate their status. But what I realized, and we started right at the beginning of COVID, these activities, um, we realized that climate action and change, when, when we talk the existing narrative that's there, at least from a few years ago, you look at a polar bear, and that immediately gives you an image of climate change. Mm. You may sympathize, but how much empathy do you feel as a community? Because you're in the global south. That relatability is not there. So when we started work, we realized it has 
to be a give and take. What the official sector talks of as climate change and what vulnerable communities, if you look at the coast alone, we have about 7,500 kilometers of coast in India. More than 20 million livelihoods depend on uh, the coast. And yet, when we talk about climate change, we are always talking in a very siloed fashion. Hmm. But people, vulnerable communities, look at it as livelihoods. They look at it as health. They look at it as migration. So we said, let's, let's approach it from that angle. And we started training women to do door-to-door -door collection of waste and segregation while leveraging culture. For example, Yakshagana is 11th century folk art. We said, let's leverage Yakshagana, create supplementary income for these artists, but let's have them talk about oceans. The plastic that we throw away, where is away? It goes into the water bodies that, like rivers and estuaries, that leads into the ocean, then into the bellies of fish, and right back to our plate as coastal uh, population. So let's bring these aspects through culture and arts that's close to the hearts of people. So you look at localization, regionalization, cultural context, and that's where we were able to succeed. And the woman is the center of the family, right? Specifically at tier two and tier three cities, she's the one that compromises on food and water during droughts or takes a step back during medical emergencies. She's also the one that takes waste management decisions at home. So let's work with students and culture to leverage decisions at home. And if a woman wants to earn income out of this work, let's leverage her as our most powerful ally because nobody knows better than her about climate change. Mm. I can't talk to a fisheries community about uh, plastics in the ocean. It's like preaching to the choir. What else can I do with you and for you? Fishermen are already saying we're finding equal amounts of plastic as fish when we go fishing. It's going to triple by 2050 is what the research is saying. But we don't even need to go to that high level. At a community level, can we organize ourselves, know what our rights are and our duties are, what laws come under the panchayats, take this by organizing ourselves and approach panchayats. Mm. That's the approach that we mm. took. Okay, so you're already talking about my next question, which is behavioral change largely. How do we encourage behavioral change in the societies and the communities we're working with? So I'll take it to Pradeep. I want to ask you, uh, you are obviously working across the Himalayas with different communities. Before this, we had a chance to speak, and we spoke about the different communities that visit the Himalayas. So you obviously have trekkers, you sometimes have pilgrims, you also have the local communities that live there on the Himalayas. Tell us a little bit more about the behavioral change, if needed in any of these groups, how you're encouraging it, and also tell us if you could change it large scale over the next few years, how would you do that? And I'm talking beyond you know, lectures, speeches in classrooms, how would you really make that impact? So yeah, the idea is always education through ground action. We never went to a village and they aapka ganda hai aur aap isko saaf karo. that kind of you know morality we never sort of you know but I took this reverse approach wherein we you know started tracking, cleaning, and then eventually the community started participating with us. That was the first thing. Then eventually I realized whatever we collect, we need to create an ecosystem around it so that people believe that we can actually dispose of the waste properly. Because in the mountains Waste disposal is not a priority for anybody because the life is very hard there. Tracking down and getting the waste down to the foothill of the, uh, the village and then transporting it to the nearest municipal corporation and which mostly they avoid because they already flooded with the plastic within, from their ward. So I thought why not create ecosystem in the rural areas wherein the footfall is quite substantial. And after three years of my work, I realized whatever I've been collecting and giving back to the Municipal Corporation Council or the Special Area Development Authority was lying there next to the river. So that was very disappointing. That's where I thought. And that's where I knew that uh, the local community never participated with me because they knew that in the end he's going to fail. If I may ask, what did that discovery look like? How did it happen? Tell us more about that moment. Uh, so, see, whenever I used to collect waste and uh, bring it back to the base, that was itself... A, is a very challenging task. And then from there, we have to literally request each and every municipal corporation nearby that, please take whatever we have collected. And we thought that 
then the corporation or the, you know, the local administration will appreciate that you have done a lot of good work. But eventually it was very difficult aspect that, uh, you know, they take our waste and sort of dispose it properly because they never had any proper scientific disposal. So again, so I thought why not create the ecosystem around the track routes wherein the, again, tourism footfall is quite substantial and make people believe that we can handle our waste, we can make it a part of circular economy and we can generate some revenue out of it and train the local communities. So from tracking, we started creating these small scale decentralized material recovery facilities and started training local communities to be a part of it. And then they started generating some revenue out of it. And this is what we've been doing for the last three, four years now. As of now, we have about six MRFs. Where, as of now, we are also building one uh, material recovery facility close to Atal Tunnel. Uh, where we have a location famous ho jati, the, all the tourists started coming in, they want to see each and every part of it. And that's where the you know, garbage comes in. So that's where we identify and we build those facilities. Currently, on a daily basis, we collect, collect about six tons of non-biodegradable waste and then transport it to the nearest recycler and then you know, connect them with the local community who are managing the MRFs. Mm -hmm. So this is what we've been doing. But lots of you know, cynicism or uh, you know, people are skeptical that these projects are going to fail, especially the local, local community, because they have seen most of the urban waste management are not very in sync with the local mindset. And, you know, we ask communities to segregate the waste, but eventually it is being dumped very close to their. Right. You can see the example of Manali, Shimla, Solon, everywhere. There's no mechanism to sort of properly dispose it of. That's why, why not decentralize it? And that's what we did. And eventually, you know, that NIMBY effect happened with me also. Like, uh, wherever I go in a village, people say that, you know, not in my backyard, sort of. We don't want to create those facilities in our village. Go to the next village and set it up there. Right. So everybody was afraid that, you know, this town may waste management facility will come, badboo will come, tourism will not come, land valuation will not come. And this was a typical mindset. So it took a lot of time to change it, but finally we did it uh, at some locations. It depends on the community to community, village to village, the panchayat head to head, because everybody has a different mindset, different you know, energy related to waste management. Right. My idea is create material recovery facilities, give them importance equal to a school in a village or a temple or, or, or like a temple or a primary healthcare center. That's mm. when we are going to create proper ecosystem around waste management in the rural areas, at the track routes or, or the urban areas. Okay. Yeah. Let me now go to Kritikriti. I want to ask you, uh, fashion, the fashion industry, different rankings say the second or the thirdest most polluting industry in the world. With fashion, you've got a particular problem that is that you've almost got to reset people's, I mean, if we want to do this successfully, you have to reset people's ideas of what they think they deserve. When one has that income in their account, you want to reset their values so they don't go shopping for that many clothes, for example, or maybe they go shopping somewhere else. How does that larger cultural change, especially for millions and millions, or rather, let's, let's talk about thousands of people across the country who are coming into money over the next few decades, how do you make that delinking take place? Uh, I would say it's hard. Uh, it's, it's, you know, which is what I was referring to earlier, that India was just about beginning to consume. And traditionally, our cultures were such, and even today when you talk to a generation before us, they would still say that, you know, we don't waste anything. We use it till the very end. And, but that, if that, is, that was the case, we, weren't, we wouldn't be producing so much and wasting so much and seeing our landfills piling up with uh, fabric waste and garment waste over the, you know, over the several years. Um, so there are, there's a cultural shift. There's a very small niche that is uh, beginning to talk about sustainability, is able to understand sustainability. There's a younger population who is uh, looking for more experiential shopping. They're looking at thrifting as an option. But all of this is still limited to a certain population of the country. There's a certain generation, there's a certain... Uh, consumer that is looking at all of this, but largely the population is still mindlessly consuming uh, more and more clothes, which do not, there's no end to that. It's when you look at the um, back end of managing these garment waste, there's no segregation that is happening. Everything that is blended cannot be recycled. The, there are technologies that there's no collection system of uh, clothing. Mm. And there are more and more organizations that are now coming to India uh, that are working towards 
managing this waste, identifying the raw material and then looking into what can happen to this material. But there is still no way of uh, making anything new out of it unless you upcycle it. And the value in upcycling is still very low. Can I ask you there also, how do you, uh, because it's tricky, a lot of, uh, you know, tier one, tier two cities, young consumers, we're used to brands, international brands, examples like Zara, Forever 21, coming here, uh, Shein, yeah. uh, coming here, selling their products, you're paying a higher price tag, and I understand that there is a reason that higher price tag exists, but you're paying a higher price tag often for clothing that is more sustainable. Yeah. How do you change the setting in people's brains in that manner over the next few years? See, we've always been working towards connecting consumer back to the product, back to what goes into making the product, back to communicating what the impact of every time you go out to shop is. And that's not just in fashion, that's with pretty much everything. So with fashion specifically, we take them back to who is making your clothes, what, go, what is their, that person's salary, what is your money going into hmm. and making them sensitive to why not this material why this material every time we research we're also learning everybody in the fashion industry is still learning as to what new materials could look like what low impact material could look like what because your top five materials your cottons and the leathers and the viscose is still creating so much pollution and there's so many like but we still have so much uh, at stake with those material, we're still exporting so much of that material that it's important to build the alternate economy parallelly while mm. you're still lowering the production of this and what those material look like. So for us as a brand, it's very important that we take people behind the scene, that this is the material, this is what goes into making the material, why should you buy a cork and not a leather, why should you look at cactus as an option, why should you look at alternatives of viscose, which is traditionally done viscose to tensile as an option, etc. So it all, and if you're buying a jeans, if it's laser, uh, you know, washed versus gone through the whole process of washing, what is the impact of all of that? Mm. So once you start taking people behind the scenes and communicate more and more, they become a little bit more aware. Well, yes, there is a price tag, but our conversation is always such that do you need 20 clothes every right, month? Right, right. Just to, just to add uh, to the textile issue, we have lots of pilgrimages in the Himalayas and uh, where they have uh, lots of holy lakes where people go to their and holy dip. And they end up leaving lots of textile waste behind them. And when I say textile waste, it's mostly undergarments. And I'm coming back from a track recently, Mani Mahesh, and there is about three tons of textile waste uh, left behind there. Yeah. So it's not in the cities also, uh, it's in the Himalayas also, at the altitude of 18,000 feet also. We have lots of uh, textile waste that we need to sort of... Yeah, handle. it's under our rivers, it's under our oceans, it's literally everywhere because once you've consumed, once you've bought that product, it doesn't have an end of its life. Cottons... Right. It, polyesters, all your blended clothes, they don't disappear. Poly there is no way of recycling polyester at the moment. And everything that you wear is blended. From your athletes, ev all your lycras or your elastins, everything is blended. So they will not go anywhere. So it will just become like a mountain uh, of clothing. So I was just wondering with you, if you come to, you know, surroundings, groups, crowds, <laughs> and your mind automatically looks at the clothing yeah, and does yeah, that situation. What? All the time. How much, how, how much carbon footprint are you wearing? But uh, personally, I feel that it's important to consume consciously. It is uh, important to consume less. Hmm. Uh, invest in your clothes. Uh, it's important to not run behind the discounted items. Don't buy things just because it's discounted. Buy things if you need them. Uh, y if they're expensive, they're expensive for the reason. You're Just the fact that, and this is something that we do at Dootledge as well, that you're able to do good and look good. Hmm. So just by investing in the right kind of clothing, you're able to do good for the society, for the people who are making it, to be able to invest in the right kind of products. And there are always cheaper alternatives. You can always swap clothing. Right. How we did. Hmm. You, could al you could always wear hand-me-downs. You, you should always be welcome to share it with your friends. And that is the kind of cultural change that needs to be in the mindset of people hmm. as well. That, okay, once I've worn that sari, if I'm not going to wear it, maybe my sister can wear it. Hmm. Maybe my friend can wear it. It doesn't Passed have to die down. in my wardrobe. Yeah. yeah, which is a tradition. Yeah, which is, a, which it's, yeah. it's just literally going back to what our parents used to do. Hmm. 
let me ask, Divya, let me ask you a question now. Um, almost to wrap up, one of the things you were talking about a little earlier that Beirut's done very effectively, according to you, is use local languages, your local cultures to impart lessons. Your point was that sometimes we don't need to impart lessons. These communities are in fact teaching us. But you were saying that using cultures, using local motives has been very effective. If I asked you to imagine that on a larger scale, how could you see, because your model is one that you've said you've practiced in coastal communities, for example, how could you see that same model being used across the country? Because one of our big questions today has been, how do we get that lesson across to people? What would you say? You just have to adapt it across the country with different languages and different art forms and things that are close to the communities that you are working in. What sometimes I find, I don't know about every sector, but the waste management sector uh, I find uh, ourselves doing is we're trying to do this one size fits all. Habits and cultures change from one district to another. Mm. Coming to her point about, you know, um, consume less, reuse, reuse, repeat clothes. We're almost celebrating people who repeated an outfit. When did we start doing that as a country, right? My mom took my old collar t-shirt and made it a, a sweeping cloth. <laughs> now we are going to the store to buy one new sweeping cloth. And if you look at different populations in India, there are different sections earning better now. We've already marketed the hell out of consumption to them. Now we're saying, okay, come, let's go back. So from urban to rural itself, there is this divide. So it's almost unfair to sort of say, how can, uh, how can we use the same thing across? It mm. has to be customized, exactly like how our MRFs are decentralized. You can't have everything go to one area and you can't focus there's also this habit of cherry picking just plastics no there's different kinds of waste that we right. uh, find right in the ocean in the hills in the urban areas wherever it is so what are we doing in terms of circularity hmm. what is happening with the other waste not just plastics because if you purchase plastics from communities and leave them you're leaving them with the burden of the other waste. So it has to be looked at from those angles hmm. as well. All right. So it, it's, it's funny because our message has touched on diversity through and through, right from the beginning to the end. Uh, Divya, Kriti, Pradeep, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having this discussion with us and thank you for staying with us through it. What an interesting and inspiring panel discussion. This was so much to learn from each of these panelists. Um, clearly showing us practical steps, what we can do to drive towards a more environmentally responsible world. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to her so much for moderating it so well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to move on towards the final panel discussion of the evening titled Balancing National Security and Biosphere. Now, balancing national security and biosphere while enabling local community initiatives is an intricate challenge of our times. National security, though essential, should not come at the expense of the environment and well-being of the communities. To bring about a meaningful change, we must foster a harmonious relationship between these elements. To moderate this session, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming once again to the stage CNN News 18's Anand Narasimhan. And let us all extend a very warm welcome to the panelists of this final session, starting with Captain Sarabjit Singh Parmar, Indian Navy. A very warm welcome to you. We're very glad to have amongst us Major General Dev Arvind Chaturvedi, PVSM, AVSM, SM, Indian Army. Thank you for joining us, sir. And let's extend a warm welcome to Air Marshal G.S. Bedi, AVSM, VM, VSM, Indian Air Force. Thank you for joining us. And finally, let us all welcome onto the stage Captain Deepak Dangi from Indian Navy.
Thank you, gentlemen, for making time out for the discussion. Over to you, Anand. Well, namaste and jai hind. Again, three veterans and a serving officer. What am I doing here on the panel? That's the big question. Well, another day, another life. Perhaps I'll be a foggy like all of you. So, but uh, first thing is that uh, she said that you know national security cannot be at the cost of environment. So, can uh, environment protection be at the cost of national security? देश ही नहीं बचेगा तो कौन सा environment बचाएंगे? So that's another counter. That's another thought process, isn't it? So how do we balance this, gentlemen? You've been in conflict. You've been. A, you've traveled across the world. Plus, you're also doing the fact that we need to be a conscious planet. We need to work towards a conscious planet. So we'll try and drive the conversations around. How do you find a mid path if there is one, or how do you balance it out? That ultimately you come to net zero. Can there ever be a net zero armed forces? Is that ever possible? So. that's where we've got to ask to drive this challenge out and how practical how possible is it or is it that there can be methods ways and means where wherever possible we try and make sure we serve and save the environment and wherever it's not nothing compromises or nothing stands in front of national security so let me ask you major general devarvin ji where do you stand on this we'll come to the initiatives but first is there sustainability ever in the brief of a task that the armed forces start with so let me ask you that uh, uh, what i would say is that you know uh, armed forces are not uh, uh, removed from uh, the current realities and uh, the future or what uh, been discussed in now so there is a sense of uh, uh, environmental protection and i can give you examples as we go by and at the same time uh, there is a requirement of you know uh, training and operations wherein the environment does get damaged hmm. and which cannot be avoided i mean if we go uh, uh, to kargil let's say you know they said that uh, uh, the bofors bofors were so uh, used in the di direct firing role that brought down the height of uh, the tiger hill i mean uh, hmm. in a way so that kind of damage would take place i mean i mean that can't be denied but at the same time there is a lot of work happening uh, i can uh, confidently say about the army uh, uh, wherein uh, there is a uh, an effort being made uh, towards uh, protection of the environment and uh, i would add here uh, i'm i've been uh, invited here because i headed the territorial army wherein uh, there are eco task forces which comprise of uh, the uh, ex servicemen the veterans uh, this idea came about in uh, 1982 uh, when the erstwhile prime minister uh, because of uh, uh, the hills of or the mountains of masuri i mean most of you may have seen that area it was pock marked because of uh, coring yeah so this uh, uh, eco task force was uh, what about and now we have nine of them so i can explain this more but uh, there are efforts being made and this is interministerial efforts being made so that's beyond what the forces have to do it's about what the forces can do to help uh, where what should not be done is being done so be the hills be the plains be the desert be the oceans so uh, one interesting factor that i'd recently gone to jaisalmer and there was a unit which was training because they were supposed to train in arid conditions but when they when when i reached there they said sir yahan to topography badal gayi because it's all becoming green and that's another unit which had taken the initiative to try and create a certain uh, level of reduce the aridity because our training ka terrain khatam ho gaya but it's become greener there so so, so this you know uh, i mean we know that uh, the armed forces take everything very seriously so this raksha ropan you know uh, the uh, environmental day etc the, the thousands and lakhs of uh, saplings uh, which are planted and it i mean there's a joke that you know in that cantonment area everyone plants a tree every day every year so there are layers of uh, trees you know and uh, uh, the uh, uh, the environment gets changed you know it becomes very humid it becomes very you know warm but uh, we keep on planting trees yeah but these these are all asides but i think the larger task like you said 
uh, that you've taken is that illegal quarrying. So how do you protect the mountains from illegal quarrying? If, if some of you can actually collaborate with Pradeep Sangwan and then do a nice danda to those who are dirtying our mountains, you know, I think you should collaborate with them, Pradeep. And thoda sa idhar se, fauji se danda bhi milega, so then there will be some people who will uh, stop littering the Himalayas. So that, that's another so option. I would, no, I would add, 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 add yeah. it more seriously here, uh, that uh, this Eco Task Force, mo most of these states, uh, I, I mean, uh, when one uh, interacted with them, uh, each and every state wanted this Eco Task Force. Hmm. And especially for this reason of, you know, uh, one is illegal coring, I mean, right here in Haryana. And uh, other states also for various reasons, like uh, Marathwada, we raised an eco task force for the government of Maharashtra. So it is, uh, it boils down to funding really. Hmm. Uh, what happens is that the MOD doesn't want to fund. MOD, uh, as it is, is uh, you know, fund starved. And uh, so are these states. So while every chief minister, every chief secretary uh, says that yes, uh, we want the eco task forces and we could do with uh, more than one, but it all boils down to who funds it. Hmm. Now, this is for the corporates. You can just go back into the fine print and does it come under CSR funding these eco task forces? If that's possible, then I think that's a big shout out and call out to all the POCs and the private organizations here. If they can back such an effort and if it comes under CSR, then why not? Absolutely. I mean, it, it can be done. I mean, uh, uh, it, it will be at a larger, at a mega scale that mm -hmm. way. But yes, uh, uh, it can be tried and I think it will be a very successful model. Army, Navy and Air Force present on the stage. So let me ask you, Air Marshal, now at, at 6G, 7Gs and you're looking at Mark II speeds, aviation fuel will now be, uh, there will be biofuel added to aviation fuel. But is that going to impact capability? How does the Air Force approach as a layman, as a civilian, how do you approach this entire task of balancing or perhaps looking at sustainability even while you look at securing our borders and the air, airspace? Yes, thank you very much. You see, whenever we look at Air Force, you see aircraft flying, burning fuel, dropping bombs, creating, you know, airfields in difficult areas like infrastructure. Okay, so what happens is, uh, yes, we can say that development, not development, I mean national security or environment seem to be uh, at uh, oppo opposing ends. Like, you know, they seem to be opposing each other in the same way, I would say, the, uh, the way science and religion seem to be opposing each other. And if I was to draw an analogy, uh, it depends the way you look at it. You know, if I was to look at uh, my thumb and my forefinger, uh, now, when I clinch them like that, I don't know whether they are opposing each other or they are complementing each other because they help me to uh, grasp something better. Mm. So, in the Air Force, there were a lot of things uh, which were earlier when we were not paying attention to, let's say, climate or it wasn't really a talked about thing. Uh, you take the case of noise uh, pollution, you take the case of uh, bird hazard, mm. you take the case of uh, other uh, species around. So they were all taken as opponents, you know, that I'm flying, the bird should not come in my way. When I was a youngster, I mean, when we flew in mm -hmm. 80s, uh, the only way to, I mean, if you didn't like something, you eliminate it. You know, that is the way of uh, thinking. But now over a period of time, we realize that, you know, you have to have a, a coexistence, you know, because birds, we realize that let's say you eliminated them. You know, I have some birds and you shoot them or you kill them. Now, it's not that, uh, I mean, unfortunately, they didn't have that WhatsApp group to tell others that don't come here, right? Mm. So, uh, you create a vacuum, the more birds will come here. So, now you had to create a better, more lucrative place for them. So, rather than eliminating them, you started managing them. Mm. So, similarly, your waste management, you know, wasn't really looked at. Now, uh, birds were not only in the airfield, right? Uh, they are in the villages around. Okay, so you had to educate the villagers. Now, there was another thing happening earlier that uh, we, we, when I say from the government side, you generally like dictating things. You know, you say you will not do this, you will not throw waste here, this is prohibited, that is prohibited, which did not really work. You realized that you had to educate people, you had to be with them, and the human resource is by far the most important uh, you know, aspect in this national security, I would say. Mm. Maybe we'll get to talk about it a little more that how this human resource affects, because we have been talking of green emission, we are talking of 
you know, carbon footprint, etc. But from that spectrum, when you see the statistics, we still have people dying of manual, uh, you know, sewer cleaning. The statistics have that about 340 people died in the last five years cleaning sewerage. And how many thousand must have got health-wise affected is anybody's guess. And this is despite the law against it. Okay, which says that manual scavenging uh, without protective gear is prohibited, but unfortunately that protective gear is not defined, that what should it be, like helmet. You know, helmet wearing is mandatory, but there is no classification. You just need to protect your head. So something like that, I think uh, the forces have become, especially the Air Force, very, very conscious where to fly the aircraft. There are uh, modified engines and... Uh, uh, on the lighter vein, I would say we are even bothered about, you know, climate control in the enemy territory because rather than dropping 20,000 pounder bombs, we have precision weapons now. Only two can do the job. So, uh, you know, we are careful even from that point of view. Thank you. We, we, we will take this conversation forward towards how we engage with local communities after we talk to the seamen here. Uh, in terms of the Navy, you are plying your vessels on perhaps the biggest dustbin. Everybody dumps everything into the ocean, and for a long time, even the ships were dumping a lot of fuel, and there was no consideration. Today, everybody is saying, let's clean it all up. So, we have all the waste in the oceans, and we have to clean it all up. The Navy has done a phenomenal job, and I think uh, Dr. Jitendra Singh commended you for what you did uh, in, in that entire coastal line cleanup. But let me ask you, sir, Captain Sarabjit Singh Ji, where does uh, the Navy come in, in this entire sustainability conversation, and when did it actually start within the Navy? We'll come into the local communities, Aramse, but first, within the Navy, the thinking. I think as uh, a naval officer first, um, mariners the world over have a healthy respect for the ocean. Nothing teaches you a greater lesson if you go against nature than the oceans, and I think the HADR part is very clear on how we're going about to do it. So there's a healthy respect for the oceans, and of course, although it's not the main charter for the Indian Navy, but it is a part and process of the armed forces, as has been already ex uh, said earlier, to be part and parcel of the biosphere. But there are certain trade-offs that happen. That, and since you speak about trade-offs, let me uh, elucidate it with an example. Even if, say, we go for MARPOL compliance, even if, say, we go for green fuels, and I'll just stretch on this uh, argument a little bit, is that if we are to shift to green fuels and somebody comes up with a fuel that fits the requirement of the armed forces for mobility, which is important, there are attended costs. Your machineries will change, your maintenance will change, your training will change. This has a big exchequer cost. So if it has to come about, it's going to be in incremental steps. It has to be in the planning process, for which, again, we need industries within India who would be able to provide those machineries, Atman Nirbhar, rather than us going abroad and seeking them. So it's going to be a very slow process. So that's one part for the Navy. And, I mean, statistics prove that if you put all the merchant marine of the world together, they are the fourth or the fifth biggest pollutant. So it not only applies for... Uh, maritime forces, but it also applies for the merchant marine. So that's a major issue that we need to look at, and it's therefore it's not only the armed, the navies, but it's also the merchant marine that needs to be brought into the picture. Oh, you make a very fair point there, but all right, we can't change the machines, we can't change the fuel, but the personnel and all that happens all around it, that can become a little more environmentally conscious. So that is happening. So our design of ships caters for sewage treatment plants, RO plants, everything that minimizes the, uh, which actually I think it is, if, if I'm correct and I'm open to correction, of course, I think Captain Dangi would be able to put more forward, that uh, we have zero pollutants from uh, our naval ships today. All of our ports are uh, MARPOL compliant, and I think the first was uh, the naval base at Karwar. I was commanding a ship. The first time I entered Karwar, I was given a 30-minute lecture on uh, radio telephony of the do's and don'ts hmm. to conserve the environment. So it's in place. The only thing is that we have to keep looking forward and seeing that can we improve yeah. 
Are there new technologies that are cost effective that can come in and therefore reduce the budgets and the cost on the exchequer? I, I think at a lot of places what's seen is that net zero. You come back to this entire net zero concept is because there are certain aspects where you will have to pollute, you will affect the environment, you will attack or uh, you know impact the environment. But can you do enough to counterbalance the damage that you're doing? Is that actually possible? Let me ask you, the, the, I'm sure you were part of this entire exercise of cleanup. Tell us some of your lessons, what you learned from that. Thank you, Anand. So as you said, uh, these two are contradicting requirements. On one side, going green, or the net zero we are talking of. On the other side, uh, we need to have security of the country. So, uh, like Captain Parmar said, firstly, what we can do internally on the ships, whether in terms of, uh, let me just give you a small brief what we are doing, say in terms of emission control. Uh, we, over the last five years, we have changed the kind of fuel we are using. Earlier, we were using a fuel which had almost 1,000% uh, more sulfur content than what we are using now. Or say the kind of exhaust emissions we are controlling. Or the kind of waste management we are doing. But still, I mean, a ship to be net zero in itself is not possible. Finally, you are going to burn some fuel. Correct. Yes, we are presently looking at uh, fuel cell-based uh, barges. We are starting slow. We are looking at biodiesel, some sort of experimentation. But net zero still looks a little distant. So, as you rightly said, what we can do is to uh, balance it out through our actions on the shore. Mm -hmm. So, we have a lot of uh, bases and establishments which I would say are really focused into it. Indian Navy is really committed to this green thing for a long time and last few years we have really gone into it. So, whether in terms of uh, solar plants, whether in terms of rainwater harvesting, whether in terms of... Uh, you know, planting trees within the bases with the uh, local community. We have been, uh, I would say, greatly successful to a certain extent that many of our bases have become independent. Another example, let me tell you, uh, waste segregation, a typical uh, pain area, especially in the uh, urban way. Indian Navy's waste segregation, whether dry, uh, you know, recyclable, non-recyclable, has been going across for a long time in the bases and it has been hugely successful, and people have understood. Also, uh, waste management in terms of what we do with that waste, uh, like uh, Gadkariji said, uh, you know, using that plastic and that waste to uh, some useful purpose. Yes, we have had a lot of uh, equipment, a lot of things when we have built the roads inside the bases. We have used that uh, waste to put back into some purpose. Uh, so to uh, I mean, sum it up in the way, yes, it is a contradicting requirement, and we are extremely serious uh, so that we don't harm the environment. If you allow me one more minute. Sure, 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 please. So uh, that is one part of it. Second, of course, investing in the technology, whether it is uh, hydrogen or whether it is fuel cell. Certainly, everybody is doing. We are in through DRDO and internal organizations we are doing. Another thing, I mean, Navy being a small service or even armed forces or even for the matter, any of us, alone cannot uh, save the biosphere or the environment. I think what is required is uh, you know, engagement, what is required is everybody, the awareness for everybody to understand and everybody to get convinced that the short-time gains of polluting the environment finally will lead to some long-time losses. The moment we start balancing out, I guess, so Navy, yes, in a way is also uh, you know, taking, undertaking a lot of exercises to engage with the local communities, at the global forums, so that uh, we come towards uh, sustainable uh, future together. We, we talk about the community engagements, uh, the final 10 minutes, but quickly, General Sahib, I want to ask you, Gadkariji talked about uh, rubber into bitumen, and that actually improves the quality of the road. Now, one of the biggest side products from the trucks, from the army, where vehicles, the wagons, tons and tons of rubber. Uh, is this all part? Is the BRO already using, doing all of this as part of its, uh, you know, uh, army or the armed forces when you're building roads in your area, infrastructure in your area? Are you already using plastic in the roads? Are you already mixing rubber or into your bitumen to improve the quality of the roads? Or is this all now going to be adapted into practice? You know, uh, I can confirm to you that uh, this uh, experiment uh, 
has been done before uh, what mr gadgari spoke about uh, spoken about uh, i remember visiting uh, the kar nicobar islands uh, and that was uh, i think 2019 and there uh, the uh, mes you would understand hmm. so they had made a stretch of a road uh, with the plastic all that uh, underneath those plastic and so is uh, bro a very uh, progressive organization mm. and uh, they are uh, incorporating all this but uh, to say that uh, it is being uh, done as a matter of course uh, that would be an overstatement mm. but the effort is there effort is there yeah are you using solar technology to generate power are you using wind to generate power to to supplement the army's power needs or the or the armed forces i'm not even going to just limit it to the territorial army what example i can give you uh, again uh, 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 um, most of you would be aware of uh, you know uh, uh, what we call the lc fencing the line of control fencing yeah uh, that is aios uh, an obstacle system really uh, there uh, a stretch of it uh, let's say uh, from noshera uh, to rajori in that area uh, that has uh, been uh, uh, is now using uh, all solar all solar all solar and okay. uh, uh, and and uh, lay that this 14 core again solar is being uh, uh, tried in a big way and as uh, uh, also is the wind energy hmm. so the efforts are on efforts are on how is the participation of the local community am marshal have you ever been to a place where you try to engage with the locals let's work on environment oh, yes. how is their reaction be see uh, uh, our engagement with local people is on day to day basis like i said you know when you have to protect your air field uh, uh, from the environment point of view or even the local protection you see why i'm saying human resource is very very important Uh, just a uh, you know anecdotal information but way back in 93 94 you know i was doing staff course and we had uh, uh, admiral das uh, fortran uh, you know commander he came and he made a very uh, nice observation and he was talking of community engagement for security and uh, he said you know half the fish in indian waters dies of old age mm-hmm. that we do not really uh, we are not a fish eating country right he said if more people were out there fishing you know then i don't need to deploy so much of navy on the borders or uh, coast guard because their economic interests will be affected by any kind of intrusion we have the same problem in border areas you know we we just heard in the discussions that there is lot of people from rural areas are moving to urban areas now why why are they doing so because there is less development now they get alienated if this border population which gets alienated can be exploited now we do not have wars daily but we have a low intensity conflict situation right uh, day in and day out so you have to take uh, deep care you can't be indifferent to what is happening on the border uh, villages unfortunately all the you know the habitats on the borders are not big cities you are not developing smart cities on the borders right they are way in so what happens to this population which is you know right at uh, these places so now why am i saying that you know we can be complimenting this that so many initiatives which are being uh, taken you know for your uh, environment um, uh, conservation you can involve uh, local people and the narrative has to be right you know take the solar parks you attack uh, all our air force stations now it's a standard thing you know they are most of the things are solar powered your heaters your lightings etc even when you uh, now there are laws against you know i mean for uh, installing solar parks but what happens is our narrative i feel is little different you know you uh, what you tell a guy that okay 5 kilowatt uh, solar panels uh, it will cost you some 3 lakh rupees and it will save you 4000 rupees per month now if that maths does not fit right in my calculation then i'm not interested in solar panel whereas your narrative has to be that why is solar panel required to begin with i mean is it for your just to save your electricity bill or is there a larger uh, uh, implication you know that is where education and uh, uh, through your schools through your like religious institutions where people believe becomes very very important that is what i meant by community uh, engagement that it will pay very rich dividend uh, intelligence is one core issue you know which will come to you from these places you know when a um, 
uh, unwanted element comes in or you know most of our we have seen our Kargil, our Gelwan, uh, the initial intelligence came from uh, you know such uh, locals okay so it is very very important that you don't alienate them by your uh, some very hi-fi uh, schemes where they are not taken into confidence so it is very important that they are in your fold. But in your experience, have you seen local communities actually far more sustainable in their way of life, far more conscious about the environment and the ecosystem that they are in, Captain Pamar? I think it's, it's developing and it's an encouraging sign. For example, uh, um, the Navy in the afforestation process has, is following the Japanese method of Milwaukee forests and they've done commendable work. Mumbai, Kochi is an example. And... Um, give you the example in uh, for those who have been to Kochi we have this backwater channel yeah which dried up all of a sudden yes and the reason was that the people who lived there they did not have uh, wasted uh, garbage disposal they did not have you know the proper facilities which a person requires and when the navy got into the act and started cleaning up and developing the communities who lived along that path also pitched in and they also sort of you know benefited by this element mm. so the backwater channel is again open it's what is I mean, it's important because uh, when you look at kerala backwaters are an important yes. part for tourism and economy so this is how the navy gets involved and the ar armed forces get involved with the local community there mm. you yourself mentioned jaisalmer i mean if you look at Jepa, rajasthan at one point in time was barren but wherever yeah. the army used to go or the air force used to go or the uh, navy goes and i think the proof in the pudding is the amount of green cover that the military stations the were uh, the nation over have so this is part and parcel where communities also get involved in so it's beneficial both sides so, that that's exactly what i heard when i went to jaipur training so that was said it in said in jest that we've increased the green cover that we've lost the arid land where we were actually training because the toposphere itself has changed. So our training methods will change. So we'll have to look at something, something else. But uh, uh, in terms of conservation, the Navy's role, and when you try and work with communities and say, okay, for turtles to come and breed, or for uh, you know, a certain level of sedimentation to reduce or to clean up the plastic that's all there, have you seen community participation? Or do they do it when you go for the drive? Two weeks later, it's back to the same drill. Or, or do they take the learnings and then they continue the practice? Well, I think it's a mixed bag. You have people, you have communities, uh, you have hamlets or villages uh, who does contribute. And as you yourself said, there are communities which are pretty sustainable in their own ways. And there's the other side also. Uh, and as I said, uh, this is not something that can be pushed. It is something you have to you know, lead. So we do a lot of coastal clean shape. We spent last year more than 100 days, specifically all the ships dedicated to 100 ship days to cleaning the coastline. We are doing uh, a lot of MOUs with uh, uh, various CSR uh, you know, channels to clean the coast, uh, especially Mumbai is one of our identified areas. If you've ever been the Mumbai sea around the Mumbai is uh, pretty, uh, yeah. you know, in bad shape. Uh, we did uh, research uh, you know, through the Habitat Trust and we realized there are three, four rivers which are the main source of uh, pollution. They bring the, all the plastic and waste into the sea. Pretty included. So presently, we are uh, working on a solution. Once it comes through, I'm sure we all come to know uh, how to resolve this. Uh, because if we cut it at the source, then I'm sure the sea will be uh, clear itself. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, some places, yes, we do get excellent uh, cooperation. Uh, one odd, it's bound to happen. So you have to keep moving. True. Well, they, that's the classic story. There are groups that clean up the Juhu Beach early in the morning and it's pick and span. And late in the night with the tide comes all the plastic and say, kya saaf kiya, kuch saaf nahi kiya. Saaf nahi hai, hami na ganda kiya because of mitthi river se raat ko pura, pure din ka kachra wapas samundar mein jata hai, samundar bar wapas pheg deta hai. So that's exactly what happens. Kabhi aisa hua, sir, ki... They are doing much better. Let's adopt this practice. Learnings from the community which happened locally. They are using this technique. Let's try and adopt it into our own systems. Final round of questions. Uh, you see, uh, 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 firstly, uh, you know, uh, I would agree with you what you said, that uh, the local communities uh, I mean, live in a much more sustainable manner uh, than we do. Uh, that's, for, uh, that's for a fact. We don't need to discuss that. Uh, before coming to your uh, 
uh, question. I would uh, give two quick examples of uh, uh, how we uh, uh, can work and have worked and have worked with the uh, local communities. Uh, in 2018, uh, Jan Rawat uh, uh, asked me to, you know, he discussed with me as to uh, how can we uh, stop uh, the uh, migration from the Dipsang plains of uh, Uttarakhand, that is in the Gadwal region. You know, uh, it, it's a disputed area. Again, the LAC is, uh, you know, perceptions are different. So, uh, the locals are permitted to go there, the army can't go there, similarly from their side. So, because of uh, the harsh uh, life, so a uh, lot of people were coming down from there, have already come down, and that, uh, you know, uh, previously it used to be called the postal uh, money order uh, economy. So, he was keen that we do something there where we can uh, get the locals to stay put, they give them some uh, economic uh, livelihood. He uh, asked me if he can give them, you know, uh, say uh, 5,000 uh, walnut uh, saplings and we can plant it uh, there for them and get them to use it. And I tried to tell him we can plant some apples also. He says, no, no, I've uh, seen this. And he says, in the valley, when I was there in Barabula, uh, I've seen the, uh, you know, the economic remuneration from uh, walnut has much more. Uh, so we will plant only uh, walnut trees. And they are more hardy. Yeah, he so you know, we are, I mean, uh, and he quoted those examples. He said, I've grown apples in Uttarakhand, I'm from there, so it, they don't grow well and all that. So, uh, finally, then I went back to him, I said, look, 5,000, we will grow, uh, we'll uh, plant 1 lakh uh, saplings. And both in the areas of Gadwal and Kumau, uh, bordering the, uh, the Chinese, or the Tibetan or the Chinese uh, border, LAC. And then we could 50,000, 50,000 in both these areas. In the Gram Panchayat land, uh, we planted through the Eco Task Force. There are Eco Task Force, uh, there are two Eco Task Forces in uh, Uttarakhand. So one in the Gadwal uh, region and the other for Kumau, we planted 50,000, 50,000. And then to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get them to sustain uh, that, you know, just not plant and uh, they wither away. Uh, so I met, uh, uh, that time Mr. Uh, Triven Singh Rawat was uh, the chief minister. So, and I said, look, uh, the Eco Task Force can't look after these uh, uh, trees at infinitum. So what do you do? So, I mean, again, you see how uh, different exposures. He said, no problems. You know, we'll get a cooperative way. Uh, so uh, uh, he, he got that done and uh, I checked up. Uh, uh, two years later, after I had retired, I said, uh, I just want to know out of curiosity as to what is the survival rate, what has happened, you know, uh, that uh, inauguration or, or the foundation stone, it, it laid for so many projects, but hardly any uh, come through. So I was told 70% uh, of uh, the walnut saplings had survived. Wow. So this is one example I want to give you. Uh, 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 firstly, and the second one, what you taught, talked about uh, the turtles. So we had raised the Ganga task force to, uh, uh, you know, uh, clean Ganga mission, it is part of, it, it is there and, you know, headquartered in Allahabad, it's got a company, I mean, in Kanpur and a company in uh, Varanasi, sorry, uh, not Allahabad, uh, Prayagraj, so Prayagraj. pardon, <laughs> you know, I, I, I have to be correct that way. So, uh, in uh, Prayagraj, uh, in the cantonment area and, uh, you know, uh, adjacent to the, uh, uh, the civilian area, there was... Uh, uh, a huge, uh, 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 I mean, a huge lake which had dried up as he was bringing out, you know, thing, they had dried up. So they dressed it and, you know, they cleaned it up and uh, they got the water to channel through it. So uh, it, you know, it, it became a marsh first and then the water came up. What I want to convey to you is that without realizing, the turtles were there, the birds were there. The other, uh, you know, the uh, aqua was, uh, the, the life was, uh, the marine life, I wouldn't call it marine life, but, you know, uh, all that life came back on its own. We didn't accept it that, uh, that to happen. You know, the tortoises uh, were back there. So these are the two examples I just want to uh, bring out that uh, these are the, uh, uh, you know, uh, incidental advantages. If we, uh, uh, you know, uh, get uh, our water bodies back into shape, uh, the whole environment, the ecosystem uh, changes. 
Fantastic, great, engaging conversation, ladies and gentlemen. Big round of applause for our panelists here. So, the the hard act of uh, securing the nation and the perhaps harder act of keeping it sustainable. Well done, gentlemen. Thank you very, very much for this fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. A big, big thank you to all our panelists for diving deep into their rich experience and sharing such inspiring and encouraging stories with us. It was really, really a great learning experience to hear all of them talk. Thank you so much for this panel. Moving ahead, ladies and gentlemen, now with this power-packed panel discussion, we are now almost come to the end of this event. I hope you've all had a great time with such engaging conversations and discussions, along with being part of celebrating the Green Ribbon Champions, whose contribution has set an example for the future of more champions and the commitment towards greener and a sustainable future for our country. At this point, I would like to invite CMD of REC, Sri Vivek Kumar Devangan, to please join me on stage to deliver the vote of thanks. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As we conclude this remarkable evening dedicated to honoring India's Green Ribbon champions, I am deeply moved by the profound commitment and passion displayed by the individuals and organizations we have celebrated tonight. On behalf of REC Limited, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for gracing this occasion with your presence. Our journey tonight has been one of inspiration and hope. We have witnessed how innovation, dedication, and unwavering determination can shape a sustainable future for our nation. The stories we have heard, the initiatives we have recognized, and the individuals we have celebrated remind us of the immense potential we hold to drive positive change in our society. The Green Ribbon Champions serves as a powerful reminder that progress towards a sustainable future is not only the responsibility of one entity, but a collective effort that requires collaboration, shared vision, and relentless determination. As we leave from here tonight, let us carry with us the, the inspiration drawn from these remarkable champions and use it to fuel our own commitment to environmental stewardship. I want to extend my sincere thanks to Network 18 for spearheading this initiative, which continues to shine a spotlight on the incredible contributions made by individuals and organizations across our nation. Your dedication to promoting sustainable practices and honoring those champions who, honoring those who champion this cause is truly commendable. Let me come to the great initiative taken by India with regard to energy transition, as Honorable Prime Minister had articulated the ambition of India to become net zero by the year 2070 and to install non-fossil fuel-based capacity up to 500 gigawatt by the year 2030. At the same time, reduce our carbon emission intensity by about 45% as compared to 2005 by the year 2030 and also reduce our carbon emission by 1 billion ton. But let me share with you that Recently, G20 deliberations have been concluded. And let me share with you the India's uh, position with regard to electricity consumption and carbon emission. The per capita consumption of electricity in India is only one third of the world average. Similarly, the per capita emission of carbon is also only one third of the world. We do have aspirations to become a developed country by the year 2047. But in this process, our consumption of electricity will also increase, will at least reach to the level, world average level, and at the same time, our carbon emission would also likely to increase. But let me assure you that India is one of the few G20 countries 
which has been able to maintain its commitment which we had promised during COP in, uh, in Paris in 2015. Our efforts with regard to reduction in carbon emission has been consistent with the keeping of global temperature below 1.5 degrees centigrade. And we hope that India will play the role of leaders, leadership role in the global energy transition efforts. The energy transition to clean and green energy is expected to lead to large investments. The Central Electricity Authority has made an estimate that it will require an investment of about 15 lakh to 20 lakh crore in next seven years by the year 2030. In REC, we are targeting to cover 20% of this business potential. Right now, our renewable energy portfolio is about 30,000 crore. We want to increase it by tenfold by the year 2030. We would like to take our renewable energy portfolio to about 3 lakh crore. And our asset under management is also likely to increase from the present level of 4,54,000 crore to about 10 lakh crore. So roughly 30% of our asset under management will come from renewable energy portfolio and will play an active role in becoming net zero by the year 2017. In closing, let us remember that our journey towards a greener, more sustainable India is an ongoing one. Let the spirit of tonight's event guide us as we uh, navigate the path ahead. Together, we can make a profound impact on our environment, our society, and our future generations. Thank you all. Jai Hind. Thank you, Sri Vivek Kumar Devangan, and many congratulations to REC Limited for powering an initiative as remarkable as Green Ribbons Champions. Many congratulations to you. And on that one, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to draw the curtains on this edition of Green Ribbon Champions. We would like to extend a big gratitude to all the thought leaders, all the policy makers, change makers, environmentalists, and a lovely audience for being a part of this very edition of this really remarkable initiative. We hope there are a lot of learnings that you are taking back with you, just as we are. Thank you so much for joining us one again. But before we leave, we would like to extend one time a big thank you to our partners for making this event a success, of course, starting with REC Limited, our knowledge partner, PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry, special partner, National Jute Board, and associate partner, Sampurna Advertising. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We draw the curtains on this edition. Please don't forget to join us for dinner. Thank you. <laughs>